So I'll call us to order. And the first, the first meeting of this morning will be the executive committee. But before we start with the executive committee meetings, I guess we're, we're in the executive committee meeting already, but let me just remind everyone of a few housekeeping things. First, you must wear your mask when you're inside the building. And uh, even though we are socially distanced, it is our policy that we'll be wearing masks. So um, to the extent that you have trouble hearing, maybe we can uh, figure something out. But hopefully you will keep your masks on all day and wear them properly. Second, we have a new sound and camera equipment. And I can already tell, I hope you all can, this sounds much, much better already. And uh, we have a fancy new electronic microphone system that we all have to know how to push the right buttons. And I suspect we will not get that right many times today, but we're going to try real hard. And so just to remind everyone that only three mics can be open at one time. So when you're not speaking, if you will disengage your mic so that the other folks who might need to speak can do so. Anyone have any questions about any of that? Thanks to our Crackshot IT group, I guess, for, is that the people I need to thank for the, uh, for this new system? And Diane. and Diane, thank you. And speaking of thanking folks, we had a reception last night with the recipients of the diversity scholarships and, uh, and, the, and the president's uh, cabinet. And that was just a beautiful event, and I thank you all. And those, uh, if you haven't had a chance to meet those who have been recipients of the new diversity scholarships, they were an extremely impressive group of young men and women. They were dressed nice, they were articulate, they are, I'm very, very, very proud that we have them as all as our students. And to those who have supported that effort, either monetarily, monetarily or through your efforts, I appreciate that. All right, so now our, uh, we'll, we will take the uh, roll call for the attendance of the executive committee. Trustee Jones. Here. Trustee Van Hooser. Here. Trustee Harper. Here. All present, Madam Chair. Thank you. First item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. I would entertain a motion to approve, or a motion concerning the minutes. I move to approve the minutes, Tom Jones. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Is there a second? Teresa Van Hooser, I second. Thank you, Ms. Van Hooser. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, uh, do we need to take a roll call vote? Voice vote is sufficient. Voice vote, okay, thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you, that motion carries. Ms. Van Hooser, I'm going to turn over the, um, the, I'm going to turn off my mic and let you have the, uh, the floor to discuss the president's review, which will just be a report. Good morning. Thank you. So President Oldham submitted his self-evaluation uh, as scheduled and confidential assessments were received, were completed by the board, the cabinet and the faculty. As the executive committee representative, I completed a confidential summary assessment and then shared it with the executive committee for review and comment. After that, I met with President Oldham and discussed those combined assessments. The final evaluation and, and then provided those to the entire board for comment. The final evaluation was provided on schedule on September 27th to the president and to the board and the goals for the 21-22 were also submitted and approved. And that's my report. Thank you, Ms. Van Hooser, and I want to compliment you. I, I personally know that that's a challenging job, not, a, not the easiest job in the world, but it is a, uh, it's a very important job, and I thank you for taking that on. And uh, President Oldham, I appreciate your openness and your accepting uh, the comments that were made. I think the board members offered some excellent um, ideas and suggestions, and I think those all got reflected, and I appreciate that. I do want to make one comment, um, sort of on the record, but um, on a personal level. The, the faculty submit comments in their, um, and they do, this, they do that anonymously. And someone made the comment that they wished that 
we would make these comments public so that they knew that we were that these comments were being read. And I'm going to just say for the record that we read every single one of those comments, all three of us read every single one of those comments, and I'm reporting that to you because for who for whomever offered the comments that, that we should make these public, we don't want to make them public, but I do want you to know that they are being read. And so because that question came up in a in a review comment, I just wanted to let the faculty and the staff and of course the cabinet and the, the other board members know that we are reviewing each of those and we appreciate your input. And all of that's taken seriously. Uh, the next comment, the next item on the agenda is the president's compensation. And because Ms. Van Hooser um, performed the president's review, I've asked her to consider the um, the matter of the of the president's uh, compensation and make a proposal. Chair Harper, Harper uh, I'm not sure. Do, would you like me to put this in the in a proposed motion, and then we'll discuss? Okay. Sorry, you certainly can. Okay. Uh, I propose that we have a five percent raise for President Oldham, and um, I guess that's all. That and for, for this year to be retroactive, uh, beginning July first of 2021. And do you want to offer, you had some comments, I think, um, when, you, when you prepared this, you had suggested some comments yes. that I think would be appropriate. Okay. Um, so I, the president exceeded expectations, leading the university through a challenging year and doing so calmly, confidently, and boldly. He continues to gain the confidence of the board, staff, and faculty. He has outstanding relationships with legislators, public officials, and alumni, and is focused on advancing the mission of Tennessee Tech. He was instrumental in raising $21.3 million of funding in a non-campaign year. And, and I think I will stop with that. Thank you. Ms. Van Hooser had shared that, that information in her proposed recommendation with the other members of the executive committee. We didn't discuss that, but I thought you all ought to have the input that she provided us. So hearing that, is there a second to that motion? I second that motion, Tom Jones. Okay. Um, I'd like to just ask the question, and I, I, I checked with the, our secretary to be sure I have the right to do this, because as the chairman, I tend to not uh, to, to not participate too much in discussions, but since we're such a small committee, I want to be sure that I at least ask this question. Are we sure that's enough? And I know that 5% um, is strong and it's stronger than what we've done in the past, but is that enough in a year where we've had some very strong results? And I just thought I would just ask that question. Just you know, thinking about this, and, th and this is what's so frustrating, I think, in our sunshine law is that we never have a chance to debate or discuss until we get here. But uh, I, I look at it as this. When I have an executive that uh, is deserving of a lot, then, then you have to decide, do you balance it between a, a raise or as a bonus? And in a time when COVID is changing the way that uh, the university does business and that way we all do business at a time when enrollment is down, um, I do think the president deserves a substantial raise, but I would rather balance that, I think, with a raise and a bonus. And I have no real preconceived idea as to what I think that bonus should be, but we, we can talk about it now. And I would, I would ask for comments from the full board we can certainly do that in the executive committee so that we have some idea going forward. And then we can also, you know, come up again in the full board meeting later on. Yes, but, and I fully expected to ask for others, but I thought if, if you also, so you're comfortable where we are. As, I, I'm comfortable where we are as the raise, okay. but I would, I think that there should also be a bonus. Okay. And I, I do think that the president has shown exceptional leadership during this time and uh, and put the university in a good position and for the future as well 
and, and that's my justification for, for saying I think he deserves a bonus as well. And I am going to ask for other comments, but I'm going to just make one more. Um, I, I look at this, and I, I do the same thing you do, Mr. Jones, which is I look at this through the lens of being an executive running a company, and I have done that, and I've had to make decisions about things. And I always think about what would it take to hire someone of that person's caliber today, particularly as a known entity. And I just don't know that we're doing enough yet, but, but I understand everybody's thoughts. And so I'll open this up then to the rest of the board members if anyone has any other thoughts they'd like to offer. You know, just, what, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, please. You know, one comment on, on your comment. You know, you're exactly right. I mean, the, the, to replace Dr. Oldham at this point in time would be incredibly difficult. You might find somebody of uh, a very high caliber, but you will not find someone that has the experience and knowledge and history with the... And can I have momentum? Yeah, and momentum, momentum with the evolution of how this university is, is changing. And so it's, it's you know, you, you, when you ask that question, you can't even ask it as, can I find someone of equal caliber? Because there's everything else behind it and the momentum that's going forward with that leadership. And that's what you have to protect. Exactly. Mr. Lowry? Yes, it was just, just a thought. I, it would be helpful to understand how um, Dr. Oldham's compensation is compared to other um, similar roles. And I think given the, the great performance from, from Dr. Oldham, we, we, would ex we should expect that, that it would be at the higher end of, of, of uh, of that band, if you will, around similar type roles. I think that's a, another way to think about where the comp should be over a period of time. So something to take a look at in the future, I think. So I, uh, I did have that information about the other LGIs from the, <clears throat> from the 2020 compensation from the, of the information that we had. Um, the average among the LGIs. You've reached the team's for, voicemail. Um, for the 2020 is, uh, and I, is it, I'm assuming I can talk numbers here. Sorry. Why don't you talk in percentages of present salary? So do you have, I mean, obviously you need a calculator to do that. I'm sorry. Hmm. No, I didn't do that. Um, hang on, let's see. I probably can. Let me just say that the average of the, other LGIs comes out to um, about $10,000 over what our, the proposed would be for President Oldham. So, um, but again, you know, you take into consideration the enrollment in those universities, as well as, you know, trying to also look at, I was trying to look at percentages where we where university was as far as compensation that you know trying to to get there but not at all all at once to you know because I do believe that we do need to um, increase his compensation and that we need to what I would call catch up um, but you know but what I also took into consideration was the enrollment at those universities versus the enrollment here because again that's part of what gives us the funds that we need to be able to, to, to make all the salaries um, for everybody at the university. When we're talking about the LGIs, um, it's, I prefer to like talk about peer institutions. I think if you're looking at schools that are comparable in size to tech, that's a big difference in some of those, those uh, when you take that whole group, that's a big, big difference. Um, and just, as a, an aside, whether I think uh, Dr. Oldham has done a great job or not leading us through this is aside from the point. Everyone's replaceable. People remind me that all the time when I'm in leadership roles. Um, and I think 5% is a fair, it's well above COLA, and so I think it's a fair, um, if the board chooses to show real confidence and, and an award for that, that's great. The difference between a bonus and a raise is that when we can consistently give percentage raises, um, that doesn't come back. A bonus does. A bonus says, we know, here's the cost of living, and we know this was a particularly tough year, and the faculty were rewarded in that same way this year. So I think looking at something 
that's in line with the way the whole university performed under the leadership is an accurate way of reflecting that. Thank you. And I appreciate you mentioning that, Professor Alcott. I, I should have said that uh, Ms. Van Hooser had, had started with, I think, the, the range of salary increases that the university got as well, right, Teresa? So that, so that we were trying to work within the same range that the faculty and staff were working in as well. Are there other questions or comments from the other board members? These are all good comments. Just to restate what you were talking about there. So the range, the faculty was between one and 7%. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the, the, the way I uh, looked at this, Tom, is, is that the average wage raise for the high performance, and you'll see this later in some of the charts that I think they're gonna get presented at the university this year um, for the for the staff was 4.78 percent and for the faculty was 4.2 percent. So those were the average for the high performers is what I looked at because that's where I believe that um, based on the information and the comments received that the president falls in that high performers category. Are there any other questions or comments from the board members? Anything? I'm sorry. I would really like to hear from other board members just before we move forward on your thoughts on it. Um, well, and, I, and I'm happy to do that. I'll just remind you that the board will actually be taking this up later today as well. So we also have that opportunity, but um, and certainly people are welcome to comment. But while we're in the heart of the discussion, it would be more efficient if the executive committee can send up a more acceptable proposal. A good point. Uh, yes, so I'm comfortable with the 5%. I, I do think, though, we have to consider the, the, who the university is competing with for students and not just, the peer, not just our peer group as far as size. And given the exceptional performance, I, I do think that uh, Dr. Oldham should be recognized. However, with the further context, I do agree with the 5%. That, that's in line with the, with the other faculty and staff and, and a little bit of a bump to, from a catch-up standpoint. Anything else? And I'll agree with what Fred just stated there as well. And I think as we go into uh, the forthcoming um, renegotiation of contract, I think that's pending in the next year or so that uh, we'll need to take all this into consideration when we come to those new numbers at that time. I'm at the same place. I, I agree with the 5%. Uh, I, I think. Uh, President Odom is doing an absolutely fantastic job, and there is no doubt he has been under a tremendous amount of pressure through this whole situation, as, as we know everyone else has, and even staff. And so I think at some level, if, if, if we try to go above and beyond that, it, what we might perceive as doing him a favor could actually create issues for him of, uh, that, that we wouldn't want to do. Uh, Not that I, we've ever done that before. No, I'm teasing, that was a joke. <laughs> but I, I'm very comfortable with, uh, with what uh, Trustee Van Hooser's proposing. Am I to understand that the uh, proposal is to give him a 5% raise and no bonus? As of now, that's the proposal. But we could take up the motion for the bonus and then follow with another, I mean, take up the motion for the salary increase and then a second motion for a bonus, or she could amend the motion as it is if we wanted to add a bonus. I, I would I'd, say, I'd I, like to leave this motion as it is, if that's okay, and then if we want to take up a motion for a bonus, I, that'd be fine. Absolutely. I just wanted to make sure Johnny's aware. We, we can, we can t make a separate motion on the bonus. We could do 4.2% as a raise and then figure the 0.8% as a bonus and meet that criteria that reflects what the rest of the campus is doing. Because within, again, we have, our enrollment is down. We existed well. There was good leadership. There was great performance on campus. And we got a lot of federal funds to help us through this. Um, so I think if we're looking at that 5% number, there are a couple ways to, to uh, present it, and that's going to be under consideration as well. I agree with 
Trustee Rose, the perception is reality in this situation. We all need to, we, we are, the campus has done a great job of coming together under Dr. Oldham's leadership and many others to get through a very difficult couple of years. I'd like us to stay together. My feeling would be if we're to keep the raise as it is, and if there's a bonus, that it would be over and above that, because I do think he's an exceptional leader, and you should reward him as such. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion on that motion? Do we need a roll call for any of these votes, Lee? Before you call the question, oh, I would ask, is there any board members, and I don't, I don't know how to do it in a, just a general way, is there any board members that would feel, feel comfortable with a higher raise than 5%? I will say I do, but but I've already said that, and so, but I don't want to go off record. I would, this is Johnny Stites, I would. I don't want to measure ourselves by the average LGI. Tech should be the leader in every aspect of our university, and that's just one, paying the guy what he deserves. Just, I'm, I'm not on the committee, but, but uh, I would uh, be more inclined to leave it at five and consider another motion for a bonus, given the extraordinary circumstances in the last couple of years. Thank you all. Is there any further discussion? I, I agree with Mr. Stites in principle, but we're talking about, if you're talking about the University of Memphis and Tennessee Tech, which are both LGIs, those are two different levels of leadership and presidents. So um, that when we're talking about LGIs, just remember that University of Memphis is in that LGI group when we're talking about that average. So it might be interesting to know what, that's why I keep talking about the peer institutions. I'm fine with him being rewarded above the peer institutions, which are the same relative size. University of Memphis is a much different um, sized university. Thank you for that. Is there anything else? I think we could also argue that size matters in certain respects, but I think there are other respects that the duty that a president, a leader takes on, regardless of the size, uh, is a, a given amount, a given standard that doesn't vary appreciably with larger numbers of students. You've got a bigger staff if you're a bigger university, you've got more money, you've got more people that you can divvy out responsibility in a smaller school like maybe we are compared to the University of Memphis. You don't have those capabilities, you don't have that staff, you don't have those that type of money, so you take on the responsibility to yourself. So I think we could have that debate um, and, and make those, what seems e e unequal, more of a level playing field in my opinion. Not disagreeing with you, but that's a, we're talking about the level research level of the university, it's not just the student body. Thank you both. I think all of those are great comments. Is, are there any other comments? Hearing none, I will take a roll call vote on this motion. The motion is a 5% raise to the president's compensation. Correct. Effective back to Ju July 1st. Is that right, Teresa? That's correct. And it's to take that proposal to the board. And to take the proposal to the board, yeah. Thank you. Trustee Jones? Aye. Trustee Van Heeser? Aye. Trustee Harper? Aye. Three yeses, Madam Chair. Thank you. That motion carries. And thank you all for that conversation. Is there a further discussion on any other matters on the President's compensation? I would like to make a motion that we submit a $15,000 bonus uh, to the full board for consideration for the President. Did you say one five fifteen thousand? Fifteen thousand. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion on that? Hearing none, we'll take a roll call vote. I would. Oh, I mean, I don't want to go too fast. I just want to. It's a number. Only I thought of. Nobody else has discussed a number. If there's any other thoughts, higher or lower. I'd like to hear them for the full board. I mean, we can certainly adjust again later, but is that appropriate? Any further discussion? Chair Harper, do you want the um, do you want the uh, 
amount now or would you rather wait to the board meeting? I think we need an amount from the executive committee to the board. So in other words, the executive committee needs to make a recommendation to the board so the board can act. This would not be a final decision. This would be a recommendation to the board. So it would be inappropriate for a non-executive committee member to make a motion at this point, You, you right? can't make a motion, but you could offer a comment, Mr. Stites. <clears throat> I have always felt like that uh, a bonus needs to be something that inspires and encourages performance. And if you are not talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of 20%, it's not going to inspire. You can't give them 2 3 or 5%. And I don't know what the math is on this, Teresa, but you might look at it. But I would be in favor of a larger number but I'll wait till the board meeting if you want me to, to make that proposal. Well, having, it's certainly, made, it, it can be taken into consideration by the person who made the motion, so. Yeah, having made the motion, I would take any and all comments right now so that if, if the consensus is to adjust the number, I would amend the motion in the executive committee. I would recommend $50,000 bonus. up to you, Mr. Jones. The motion is yours. Barry, Radonna, Fred? Yeah, I, I'm, I don't have the exact numbers in my head as far as percentages, but I, I tend to err on the side of uh, Mr. Stikes's uh, comments around, I think the bonus needs to be meaningful. And uh, I think, you know, somewhere in the range of, I would say 12 to 20 percent would be meaningful in, in, in my opinion. So. I don't know what those numbers uh, end up being, but uh, that's my my thinking. Uh, I have a question. Have we had previous bonuses in the past um, comparable uh, to have an idea of um, exactly how big is the 15,000 as to other uh, bonuses in the past? We did offer a bonus one time before and we had some um, uh, I'll just say the, the president ended up uh, taking the bonus and donating it back to the university for a scholarship. I believe that's the only time we've ever done a bonus. Is that true? Yes. So, okay. Hannah, that's, uh, that's uh, the only time we've ever done a bonus. We had a little um, challenge with the just people had some different thoughts about it, and the president ended up uh, being grateful for the bonus and taking the bonus and donating it to the university to be used for scholarships. Okay. And if I'm not mistaken, I think that bonus was in the neighborhood of 60,000. Is that right? Am I re remembering that correctly? That that's correct. And it was a 17.7%. And then, uh, there was one that was, uh, at the beginning of 2020 chair Harper, that was, a uh, four, a little over 4%. Okay, so just at least that's the data that I have. Uh, I'm sorry, Teresa, oh. can you say that one more time? The, the last part about the, the, there were two bonuses or just yes, one? Yes, I oh. have the records that I have says that there was a bonus that was uh, um, at like a little over 4% that was given at January of 2020. Is that, I'm looking at Phil, to, I mean, that's the information that I was given. I don't know if that. Let's ask Cleary. Is she here? Cleary, do you know off the top of your head? That's where I got my data, so. Yeah, th th that's fine. If, if, if Trace is right, you can just nod your head. Yes, thank you. That's a good question. Thank you, Hannah. Anything else? T so, Tom, you've heard kind of some of the guardrails on this. Where would you like to go? Barry, do you or Radonna have any comments? I'm, I, I'm a, I would say that I lean with what Johnny's saying. I think it needs to be something that's uh, more commensurate with the responsibility. And uh, if you look across uh, industry, a $15,000 bonus for someone that's leading an organization like this is not sufficient, in my, my opinion. I agree. I, I appreciate throwing out a number, and I, I know that's what you did, Tom. Um, but I think uh, more would be more appropriate. And this is very awkward because in no way would I want to slight uh, 
President Odom at all. I think he is an absolutely wonderful individual and doing a great job for us. Um, but I do think that we, we have to consider the, the balance of the position that we're in, that it's not necessarily industry dollars or business dollars. We're talking about students paying fees. We're talking about state dollars. I think if we could find other ways to, uh, to perhaps let President Oldham know what a fabulous job we think he's doing outside of a, outside of a bonus that could, uh, again, cause a red flag to many of the other folks within this, within this institution, within the Tennessee Tech that we also depend upon to make sure that the overall university works well. And I don't want to put him in a position where he gets criticized because of that. So if we could find another way outside of a large bonus of, of dollars, I think that's something we ought to consider. I guess the other thing that I would say is um, it, uh, you know, he, he set a great example the last time we gave him a bonus and turned right around and gave that bonus back to the university which I think shows the integrity of the type of individual he is. Uh, he and I have not talked about it, but I would assume that part of that is because he knew that he didn't want to be outside of the norm of where everybody else was, that he depended upon to make sure that Tennessee Tech is the kind of university that we all want. Uh, so I'm uncomfortable with it for that reason. Not that I'm uncomfortable that I think he is worth far, far more than what he's getting paid and, and far, far more than any bonus that we're talking about. Uh, I just think we could end up having unintended consequences of, of, of trying to uh, show our appreciation. Thank you, Ms. Rose. Mr. Uh, Professor Alcott, you had your mic turned on. Yeah, quickly, just doing a, a little bit of research, the average, um, one of the averages in bonuses for presidents of universities is, that I found was 8% or 10 to 20%. So rather than an industry standard, or if we call university presidency an, an industry standard, that would be something to reflect on. Thank you, that's very helpful, and I think Mr. Jones's proposal is about half of that lower number, so just so, FYI. Yeah, and just to give some perspective, if I could, since I'm the one that has the numbers here, um, a 10% would be around $35,000. Just because you're muffled a little bit, did you say 10% would be around 35? 10% would be around $35,000. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Stites, you had your microphone on. You turned it off. Sorry, I shouldn't have called on you. Uh, well, I, I appreciate what Radon is saying, but I don't understand how you compensate and reward and recognize people if it's not with money. I mean, he, we can pat him on the back and say, you did a great job, but that's not going to do what we're wanting to do, which is recognize him for performance and keep him here because I don't want to go out in the marketplace and try to find somebody that's equal to fill. I don't want to do that. I, I, Maybe I you can guys tell you I don't to, either. You all guys will feel fine about that, but I think we're going to struggle to do it at the price we've got him. So I, I'm, I, I just, maybe there is a magic wand that you can use, but I don't know what that is. And so that's why I defaulted to money I think the money is the way you do it in this environment. And frankly, if some other people don't like it, I think it's interesting, but my job as a trustee is to do the right thing for the university, not to, to gain public opinion and, and uh, ingratiate myself with some segment of our university. I thank you all for your comments. I believe now everyone has commented at least a little bit. Uh, Mr. Jones, you have a motion on the floor. Do you intend to leave that motion as it is, or given the input you've just received, do you want to make any changes? Given the input, 
Well, first of all, I want to comment that for decisions that are this heavy, it requires uh, true and honest, open debate from everyone. And so I, it, it was necessary to push these motions and to ask for comment to, to have that. So I'm going to upset the apple cart even further, and I'm going to amend my motion. I amend, I move that we adjust the let me Let me just say, stop you for a second. If you're going to amend, you need to amend. If you want to withdraw your motion, you can withdraw. But I would, either way is okay, but we need to do one or the other. I withdraw my motion, and I make a new motion, if that's what it takes. And I think that's right. Is that right, Mr. Secretary? That will work, yes. Okay. I think either will work, but we're on the path. Um, I make a motion that we adjust the president's salary to a 6% raise with a $20,000 bonus and submit that to, to the full board. And I, did, and I say that because um, I do believe that he is uh, over and above the average of the uh, top leaders. And I think I think it's a package deal that you got to do both. And I do believe that for leadership of his caliber, regardless of the size of the university, he, there is some catching up to be done. And so even though we voted previously on 5% hearing the discussion, I think it's worthy of 6% plus a bonus. Okay, thank you. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? So this would. Madam Chair. I, I'm sorry. We'll probably need to have a vote to rescind the previous motion in addition to this vote. We need to have a vote to rescind the previous motion. Can, the previous, it, the one we've already passed. Could, could it be included in this it motion? It can be, yes. So could you amend this motion then to include a rescension of the previous motion? Well, I think I would have to do that since I made the previous oh, motion. sorry, you're exactly right. Well, I don't actually know that you would have to. I think what we could do is rescind our previous action because it's not just a motion now. So I'm way into Robert's rules, but I think if Mr. Jones moves to rescind the action and make a new motion, would that be okay? And is that all right, Mr. Secretary? Yes. All right, Mr. Jones. Yes, my motion is to rescind the previous action and adjust the president's salary to a 6% raise and a $20,000 bonus. Okay, thank you. Now, Ms. Van Hooser, would you second that motion or are you? Yes, I second. All right, thank you. Sorry for the confusion, everybody, and I hope we're doing this right parliamentarily, but I think we all understand what we're trying to do. Is there any further discussion? Then I'll take a roll call vote. Trustee Jones. Aye. Trustee Van Hooser. Aye. Trustee Harper. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you all. And thank you all for your candid conversation. And I think we um, have a, and, and that motion, by the way, was to present that to the full board, right? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Just making sure that we got that correct in the minutes. All right. So the full board will take that up at our meeting this afternoon. And that is, by the way, what you have when you have a sunshine law that says we can't discuss things off the record. In case people think we do, that's exactly how we discuss things, right, is in public. So thank you all for your candor, and thank you all for your uh, indulgence as we went through all that. Um, good. All right. So our next item on the agenda is labeled the comprehensive review, and I want to just... Um, make a comment first, and, I, and, and Captain Wilmore actually referred to this a second ago. I have, um, I've been thinking for a while that it's time that we started thinking about the president's, the president's contract doesn't expire until about a year and a half from now, but I think we would be foolish to wait until the last minute to be working on that, and honestly, I would, if anything, I'd love to go ahead and get a new contract in place with some additional terms so that we have, and particularly I was encouraged by our conversation today that I don't think any of us would disagree. We want this president and we want him for as long as we should legitimately have him. And uh, 
and I think that um, I'm in favor of of a new contract that would give us some additional term, some additional confidence that we've got some uh, longer term goals. I've spoken to the president about this and, and I've asked him specifically to give me a list, and he's done this, of things that he wants to get done in his tenure as president. Um, I'm not gonna share those with you all because this is way broader than a kind of a goals that you use for an annual review, but. But he has a lot of very big goals that he still wants to get done here for Tennessee Tech. And I think you would all agree that he has been a man of action while he's been here already. And we could not be more pleased with, I mean, if you look around this campus, personally, I look around the campus and I don't think it's ever looked better. I don't think the students are, could be any better. Obviously, we want more of them. That's uh, not not a secret that enrollment is a challenge, diversity is a challenge, but he's working on both of those. So I'm going to be working with him and thinking about a new contract um, that I will bring to you all at some point in the near future. I don't know exactly when. But as part of that, one of the things I considered was that in our in our procedures for the review of the president, there was a provision, and I could call it up. Let me see if I will. I won't try to do that now. But uh, a provision that says that um, every three years or so, the board should, or the, excuse me, the executive committee, not the board, but the executive committee should consider performing a comprehensive review, which involves both the president and the, and the overall university. It goes to a broader range of audiences and it's done by an outside firm. We talked about this a couple of board meetings ago because we were coming into this year where this would be the time to talk about it. I believe it's the time to do it and I think that getting that done ahead of doing a new contract would be helpful. It would inform both what we need to get done and what we're looking for in terms of a president and so oh, the Secretary Lee is giving me, Secretary Ray, excuse me, is giving me the um, the words, and I just want to remind you. It says uh, the these are the procedures for the president's performance reviews and comprehensive reviews, and it says two years after the first annual assessment of the president is conducted, the executive committee should consider whether or not to perform a comprehensive review of the performance of the president's performance in a subsequent year, and we're now in that subsequent year. If such a comprehensive review is to be performed, the executive committee may choose to engage the assistance of one or more external advisors. Thank you, Lee. Um, I was involved with, the, with writing those procedures when we very first came together as a board, and the AGB recommends this, the Association of Governing Boards recommends this as a, as a best practice to have a comprehensive review every few years. I have included in your packet a proposal, and, and let me just tell you what I have done prior to this. I asked um, the, the staff, the administration, really Lee, Ray, um, to work with individual consulting firms that we know that do comprehensive reviews, and I asked him to get me some proposals for those comprehensive reviews. We had three firms that submitted proposals to us all th well, let me say this. All three are ones that we are familiar with as a university. Um, two are what I would call almost household names for us now at Tennessee Tech and even at the board. The one that is not especially a household name is the one that I'm actually recommending that we use, and I'll explain that. The... Um, the, the proposal that's in the board, board books is from the association, it's, it's AASCU, American Association of State Colleges and Universities, and I think they go by ASCU, is that correct? Thank you. Um, they, they gave us a very thorough proposal, and just to be honest, um, I thought it was the most, I thought it was the most thorough and also the one that seemed to have the most materiality. Some of them had more kind of coaching and stuff included and some other things. But these guys actually had, I think, the things that we wanted the most. And also, they happened to be the least expensive. So 
With all that in mind, I have brought to you a proposal from the Associ American Association of State Colleges and Universities, uh, a proposal to perform a comprehensive review and to spend $19,500 to do that. And I'm going to ask them, if we approve this motion at the executive committee level, I'm going to ask them to get started as soon as possible. And then we would like to use that to inform the decision about a, a new contract with the president. So again, we'd welcome input from the other board members, but this will be a vote of the executive committee. Is there any discussion on that? I make a motion that we hire an outside consultant to conduct a comprehensive review of the president. I'm not specifying the outside consultant firm. I'll leave that to the judgment of the chair. Okay. And as I understand, just for clarification, Chair, this does not have to go to the full board. It's an executive committee decision, correct? That, that's correct. Thank you. Let me note that we will need to just run this through our, our legal advisor and contract advisors once we approve it and get a contract from them. Oh, thank you. That's a great point. And, we are and, a member would, of this association, right? Correct. And I would say, too, in my motion, I'm just saying to hire an outside consul consultant to conduct a comprehensive review of the president, but I'm assuming that comprehensive review really expands further into the university as a whole or how he functions in his role as president for the university. Kirk. Yes, and if you look at the proposal, it, it's really very specific what they will be looking at and what they'll consider, but it is really to inform our judgment about the president and what what he needs going forward. It's not just a, is he doing a good job, but it's what could he use from us as well. So, which I think is really helpful and would inform a contract, I believe. I guess the point of it is the chair and the vice chair, I would ask that you, I mean, you, you, you have the freedom of choosing who to hire, but who you hire also really determines as to what is being evaluated. And I think that's a, a broad, whiteboard that you're going to have to have to assess but, right. I, but I leave that to your judgment and I appreciate that I think we probably ought to put a budget in there as well wouldn't you agree Lee yes I think if, so if, we're going to be, if you're going to be more open-ended why don't you say up to twenty five thousand dollars because the AASCU is proposing nineteen five but just in, in case we find out that that's not a and I don't think that includes their travel right correct okay so I will amend my motion to, to hire an outside consultant to conduct a comprehensive review of the president up to $25,000 with the consultant to be at the discretion of the chair and vice chair. Okay. And I'm requesting that both of you agree just to have two people. That's great. Can we add plus travel on that? Because not 25,000 plus travel as Thank amended. You. That probably gives us the most. I second. Excellent. I think that's an excellent motion, Mr. Jones, and, and thank you, Ms. Van Hooser. Is there other discussion? I have a question, Johnny Stites. Um, I'm unclear about what we're going to gain by spending $25,000 for a consultant that we can't do here as a board. It's a great question, and let me, and hopefully you've had a chance to review their proposal so you know what they're going to do, but they're, they will actually interview, directly interview people. You know, we do these confidential um, evaluations now, and we get re responses from the cabinet, we get responses from the board members, we get responses from faculty. They will do non-confidential, but direct interviews with people in those same categories, plus alums, plus uh, donors, plus community leaders, plus political um, folks in Nashville. Um, who am I leaving out, Lee? Students. Students, thank you. That would, yeah, that would, that would be kind of important, wouldn't it, students? Yeah. I think all constituencies you could think of seem to be included. Yeah, I mean, it, but but those are the constituencies we're thinking of there specifically. And and just to be honest, Johnny, I have done these reviews of the president myself, and now Teresa has as well, and I, I haven't asked her this question, but I think she would agree with me. We're not professionals at this, right? This is not what we, asking the questions and getting the right answers and putting it all together, 
we don't have the right uh, skill set for that. We do the best we can. These are folks who are professional at that, and they have done this for other schools, and so they'll have a, they have a, uh, an expectation about what is best practice in these areas. You know, Johnny, I actually agree with your thought there, except that to me, you know, as, as a board of trustees, we really have one employee, and that's the president. And I want to double check on how we're doing our job. And so I don't look at it as much as just an evaluation of the president, but it's a double check on how we're evaluating him as well and how we're doing our job. That's just the way I see it. That, that's why I think it's worth it. And I'll just remind you again, because I was involved in writing these procedures, I really bucked against this in the beginning because I thought this does seem like a lot of money. And, and we talked about doing it initially, and I said there's no way we know enough to even do this yet. I feel like we're getting to the place where we probably can do this and do it well. And it was a best practice recommendation from the AGB back uh, when we were writing these procedures, and it remains a best practice recommendation from the AGB. So I think it's, as a board, I think it's something we should strongly consider doing. Does anyone else have any thoughts on this? I, Trudy, I would just, this is Teresa, yes, Trudy, I would like, I, I second what you just said, is, is that, you know, we do the best we can with the information that we have, but having somebody that's come in independent, one, and that has the experience on doing this before and knows exactly what to look for, and can give us guidance on how can we improve, hopefully we can add this, if it's Good not point. already in there, the process, how can we improve our process so that going forward we can do a better job in doing our evaluations on an annual basis. So, you know, if we haven't got that part in there, maybe we can look at that to see if they could also give us some tips on how to do that. But having somebody from the outside, especially at this time when we're getting ready to renew the contract, I think is, a, is an important piece. Thank you for that. Yes, Professor Alcott. I would say from a campus perspective that an outside evaluation would increase the trust in the Board of Trustees decision making and I'm in favor of it. Thank you. I think that's a really good point, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Is there other discussion? I'll just point out that, that, that we, won't, we will not discuss this further at our board meeting this afternoon. So if you have thoughts on this now would be the right time to bring this up. I will report on it this afternoon, but we won't be discussing it. I just wanted to hear Dr. Oldham's oh, thoughts yes, on it. Oh, yes, thanks. Great idea. Oh, I think it's a good idea. Um, and uh, the, the particular group that uh, Chair Harper is recommending is, is well-versed at this. They've got a lot of years of experience doing this on other campuses. And they actually have a lot of former presidents that are involved uh, as part of this. So I think you get a... Uh, a pretty uh, honest, well-rounded uh, perspective on the the presidency and and uh, overall how things are going. So I, I think it's a good idea. Thank you. Yes, thank, and thank you, Mr. Jones, for suggesting that. Is there anything else? I'm hesitant when we talk about twenty-five thousand dollars to spend to do an assessment that we have done our own in the past, but. Hearing the conversation and thinking through it, I think it's money. It would be money well spent. I thank you for that input. And I'll be honest, I have fought this really since we became a board, but I've just reconciled myself to the fact that I just think this is going to, I hope anyway, this is going to take us to a different level of understanding. And then my suggestion is after we do this one, we may decide we don't want this to be part of our procedures anymore. And then we can say that was a, that was a waste of money or that was a big mistake. But I don't believe it will be. I, obviously, I wouldn't be recommending it if I thought it would be a mistake. Yeah, I think, at, like uh, Ms. Van Hooser mentioned, it's, uh, we'll probably learn a great deal from it, and we can take that forward uh, yes. in, in our assessment of what we do in the future. Yeah. So is I, that... I, I, I just I hadn't commented, well, but I, I think it's the best practice from a governor's standpoint. It makes a lot of sense, so I'm very supportive. Great. Anyone else have anything else to offer? Well, thank you all very much. And, and if I understand the motion correctly, Mr. Jones, it is that you're recommending that we do the, um, 
the comprehensive review use an outside consultant, spend up to $25,000 plus travel, and that you're leaving the discretion of the selection of the firm to Ms. Van Hooser and me, the chair and vice chair. That is correct. And I would hope we would make that decision, Teresa, very quickly because I do want to get this moving. So that's, that's all I'll just say about that. But um, I will, uh, in order to do that, I'm actually going to let Ms. Van Hooser then look at the other proposals we got and make sure she doesn't see something there that she would rather use one of these other firms because it's, uh, since you're leaving it to the two of us, which I think is great. I think it takes two set of eyes, uh, not to just not for the burden to be just on you. I uh, thank you for that. Anytime I can have some help, I appreciate that. All right, I would t uh, entertain. I think we'll need a roll call vote. Did yeah. we get a second? I think we got a second, didn't we? Yeah. Yes. Trustee Jones. Aye. Trustee Van Hooser. Aye. Trustee Harper. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Is there any other business to come before the executive committee? I probably should have said at the very beginning, I should, not probably, I should have said at the very beginning, welcome to Professor Alcott, uh, faculty representative now on the Board of Trustees. This is our first time to have you in person with us. We've done some Zoom meetings. And to Ms. Hannah Willis, our student trustee, we're delighted to have you with us today. And uh, we are excited about what you're going to bring to our board as well. All of our student trustees, all of our faculty trustees have been excellent, excellent members and I, I you all both have uh, big shoes to fill. Uh, is there anything else to come before the executive committee? Okay, I've got one more thing I need to say. I, this, this breakfast this morning with the faculty, um, I, I hope many of you got to sit with faculty members and talk about some things. I had one of the best conversations, and I don't think any of the faculty members are in the room right now, but we just had a terrific, Tom was there as well, and we had a terrific conversation about what we're expecting from our faculty and how everybody isn't perfect, but they're working to get better, and I just found it to be really great, and I think the faculty... And Dr. Bruce, I'll say to you, I think you and Dr. Oldham are doing a great job with our faculty, and they were all consistently supportive of each other and of you all, and they're all proud of what we've been able to do through COVID, I think. And so I was just really pleased to see that and to hear that, and would you agree, Mr. Jones, that that was a... Absolutely. A, it was one of the best conversations, I think, in we've ever had with the faculty. So I'm just really pleased. So uh, maybe Professor Alcott, you could share that with the Faculty Senate because I think they was, those were uh, Faculty Senate leaders that were there. All right, well, if there's nothing else to come before this committee, I'll adjourn this committee and I believe, I'm sorry, I think our next one is the uh, Academic and Student Affairs? Correct. All right, I will adjourn my meeting and Ms. Rose, it's up to you. Thank you, Chairman Harper, uh, and we will call the Academic Student Affairs Committee to order, and Secretary Ray, would you call the uh, roll, please? Trustee Wilmore. Here. Trustee Alcott. Here. Trustee Willis. Here. Trustee Rose. Here. All present. Very good. Thank you, sir. Um, we need to uh, get approval of our minutes for the June 24th meeting, and I would entertain such motion. I'll so move. So move. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Very good. Thank you. We have a proper motion and second. Uh, any opposition? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, Aye. likewise. Okay, you've approved our, our minutes. Um, uh, the, we will now um, go to a uh, enrollment report from Dr. Brandon Johnson, and he's going to talk to us about the enrollment as well as major initiatives in enrollment management and career placement. So, Dr. Johnson, welcome. Glad, good to have you with us today. Thank you. It's good to be here. It's good to be here, and, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present the information on enrollment. I'm going to start with uh, state-level enrollment data. Uh, look uh, across the state at other LGIs and and the UT system, 
and then uh, move on to what Tennessee Tech experienced from an enrollment standpoint, some details on our enrollment uh, for the fall, and then quickly move into the major initiatives uh, that we are focusing on to um, regain the momentum of, of enrollment growth and uh, sort of move past uh, the pandemic and, and uh, look for a bright future when it comes to enrollment outcomes. All right, so this slide uh, represents the headcount and full-time equivalency um, change from fall 2020 to fall 2021. Um, so it compares the other public four-year universities in Tennessee, both the uh, LGI and the UT system. As you can see, the regional public universities mostly experienced a decline in total headcount and full-time equivalency, that FTE. Uh, FTE uh, typically drives our institutional budget and is calculated by taking the total number of enrolled credits by 15 for undergrads and 12 for graduate students. A few notes on this slide. TSU is Tennessee State University. This is Tennessee's historical black college or university, uh, often referred to as HBCU. From my understanding and, and the information coming out of the profession, the enrollment profession, uh, this is a national trend uh, for HBCUs. Uh, as their enrollment grows, as their notoriety and experience has been well received over the past 18 months. UTS is the Uni University of Tennessee Southern, formerly known as Martin Methodist College. Um, this enrollment, uh, I don't have the exact numbers, but it's a, it's a slight headcount enrollment, I, I want to say, of 40 students. They have less than 800 students on their campus. And so they did, although it looked, looked substantial from a percentage standpoint, uh, it's not overly substantial from a headcount standpoint. And UTHS is the University of Tennessee Health Science Center that focuses on health science programs like dentistry, uh, medicine, nursing, and pharmacy. So as you can see, uh, Tennessee Tech uh, is in the center of this in the purple and gold. Uh, both the headcount and the uh, full-time equivalency uh, declined by 3.4% year over year. I'll, new, I'll now move into the details from a Tennessee Tech standpoint. Uh, so this, this slide provides internal data as to what we at Tennessee Tech experienced. Uh, as you can see, our first time freshman cohort um, was down compared to previous year. Uh, we also experienced uh, a greater uh, rate of departure than we had previously as our freshman retention rate is also down, uh, coming in at 73% compared to 775 last year. Uh, that retention impacts the other freshman line uh, as, uh, along with the sophomore headcount line. Under, undergraduate enrollment declined 4.5% year over year. Uh, graduate programs showed growth again this, this year, adding 3.4% more students this fall compared to previous fall. So great work and outcomes from the graduate school. I realize it might be hard to quantify, but this freshman retention rate decline, any, any idea of what might have been the issue or issues? I mean, do you have any, anything to go along with that? Yes, yeah, so, um, so, so sort of the, the situation we found ourselves in with the freshman class is, is that, the, I didn't hear the question, I'm sorry. I said, you've got this deep decline in the freshman retention rate. So I know it might be hard to quantify, but to, can, do you have a, reasons why you surmise why, why we, we saw that? Yeah, so the freshman retention rate, you know, there's, a, there's I think, a variety of reasons that, that um, is leading us to this. Um, it, it doesn't follow our trend. We were trending up until this last year, and so um, there are some, and, and I'll, I'll talk about a, a couple of them, some very specific programs that align with who we are as an institution, and that was disrupted. And so our, our ability to continue to, from a, from a student success standpoint, connect with these students, ensure that we're monitoring them. Uh, some of those programs, uh, we had to pivot quickly and try to find new ways to find these students, uh, like class attendance, things like that, that we need to, that we track. 
um, I believe you'll see this trend across uh, not only Tennessee, but across the country as um, students uh, made decisions to, uh, for whatever reason, um, to uh, change institutions or, or to uh, simply not return to college based on the full implications of what they experience. So uh, again, we, we provide a very, especially for our undergraduates, a very traditional college experience. And, and um, all the faculty and, and staff did an incredible job moving us on line and, and, and using the technological resources we have. Uh, I do believe the students, um, the response to that was either they struggled a, a bit more than they had historically, um, or they were overwhelmed with the circumstances and decided to either move closer to home or, or try another institution. So we, we saw a lot of that coming in. Our transfer numbers were strong this year, where students were telling us that the experience at their institution wasn't what they expected. And, and so uh, sort of the grass is always greener. Um, they were seeing, um, they were seeing uh, Tennessee Tech as, as an option. Um, I believe Provost Bruce will get into some of the, the withdrawal numbers, um, but last fall we did see a pretty substantial number of students withdrawal within that first fall term. Um, and uh, that was the circumstances in which these students came in on. Uh, again, first time in college, not truly understanding all the, the, the environment that they, they find themselves in, trying to connect, and, and even though we were primarily face-to-face, -face, we had that experience, I'm not sure they were connecting as much as they had in the past. So, good hey, question. Brandon, didn't you see didn't we see a lot of uh, relatively undecided majors in that category too? The, the, predominantly, that, that those are the students that were more vulnerable. Is that right? It, correct. So our uh, our undecided majors, the so students who haven't formally declared a major, uh, this is a group that always is of concern to us. Um, these are students who have invested in Tennessee Tech, invested in a college experience, but at this time they're not. Um, totally confident on what they want to major in, right, what that career aspiration is. And so uh, we did see a, a pretty high departure rate of those uh, undeclared students, um, which led to uh, some formal adjustments internally. We, we have actually, most of our freshmen now are in a class um, that specifically addresses uh, sort of career readiness and, and career preparation. So we work with them very intimately to figure out what is their desire, what is their um, passion, and how can we attach that to a major that drives specifically to a four-year outcome of, of a bachelor degree? And so we've adjusted internally as we, as we notice this to find ways to continue to connect this group to campus uh, to make sure that, um, one, they feel comfortable as an undeclared. That's, it's okay to be undeclared. Um, but they also feel supported that we're going to help find them the path forward. And so we, we have created a new program and a new course uh, in, in um, cooperation with uh, interdisciplinary studies, the College of Interdisciplinary Studies, to provide this. But I would also say, and correct me if I'm wrong, Brandon, but very to your question, I think this is the effect of COVID, and, and I think it's it's consistent with what we're hearing from uh, That was every, my follow-up question. Was, every other institution, it, it's a COVID impact. I was going to say that, in addition, it goes, needs to be mentioned, some students became ill and did not continue, and some students had their families impacted and left school for that reason. So it was, when you look, percentages are, are always scary to look at, but when you look at the actual numbers up here, and I think about the students, my colleagues and I had missing for class for weeks at a time, and that many of them continued, uh, we did pretty well with that number. I appreciate those comments. So what we see on an annual basis, sort of normally, is that life life happens to these students. And, and I think we saw more of that this year, where they were um, either from health concerns, personal or, or, or family related, uh, financial in terms of the implications of this pandemic on, on you know, the first generation and, and the students who uh, walked that very you know, thin line of being able to afford a college education. And so there was a lot, you're absolutely right, there's a lot of variables that we were uh, monitoring, engaging, being proactive with. Um, and, uh, you know, we celebrate the students that returned and, and we, we will continue to engage those that departed and, and just make sure there's, if there's anything we can do for them, uh, that they know they're welcome, um, for the most part, back. Do, do we have any idea if this is comparable to other peer institutions? Is this sort of the national trend with COVID this past year? Generally speaking, I would say it's the national trend. I don't have those comparable data and I'm happy to provide those once we get that level of data. 
Dr. Johnson, now the thing that concerns me is last spring and all through the summer, we kept hearing our enrollment is up, our enrollment is up, our enrollment is up. And then a surprise to me was that our enrollment was down. And I don't know what algorithm we're using, but do you have plans to use it again? Are you gonna get something that's more accurate? Because I don't think it's helpful to have one outcome expected and actually experience a different outcome? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so as we look at how we predict future enrollments, uh, one of the implications of the pandemic is we have no historical data that suggests what the behavior of the students will be under these circumstances. And so historical data is, is actually uh, li helpful to a limited uh, basis on projecting future outcomes. And, um, and, and, I, and that's sort of the element that we tried to hedge and, and tried to pr predict is un under sort of these circumstances, what would be the true implications of the pandemic on our students from a, from a freshman class? Um, how well did they yield over the summer? Um, you know, when we, uh, March, April, if, if you recall, we were in a very different situation. The optimism was very high. There was uh, a lot of um, sort of, we're, we're past this, we're gonna be able to move forward. And then over the summer, things changed on us. And, and um, some of the circumstances that, that we found ourselves in, you know, we early on didn't, didn't necessarily expect. Uh, and, th and I think that goes with the retention of students too. I think there was a lot of movement over July, August in terms of what, uh, what students were deciding to do. Um, and and I, I think the effort was there. I think the connection was there. Um, obviously the outcomes are not what we wanted. Um, and so I, I take that and, and I appreciate that because we do have to revise and, and actually moving forward, think about what we do with this year, right? Because now this is in our historical trend na analysis. And so how do we treat this year in terms of predicting the future? Because I don't believe students will, will behave the way they have in the last 18 months moving forward. I think we'll be back probably towards a more normal uh, human behavior. The, the one that seems to, I guess, stand out to me the most is, is the junior level because you would think by that time that they're pretty confident in where they want to go and, and what they want to do and that they're ready to finish, right? But yet that we see that's the highest drop, drop is in the, is, I mean, 9% is a pretty significant change in the, at a junior level. I mean, I remember when I was a junior, it was like, you know, I, I'm ready to finish this and, you know, move on. So do we have, I mean, I get the, the COVID stuff and that it, you know, they could have been the ones that got sick or they could have been the ones with the family, but it just seems like a pretty significant percentage at that late stage of their college education. Yeah, so we'll, we're going to dive into, in, into the elements of this, so I can partially explain it. Um, so when, when these, are, these are candidacy types, and so what, what, what is seen by a sophomore is based on credit hours, not necessarily years at tech. Um, so some of the students who, uh, even a freshman retention, does impact sophomore, junior uh, status because they come in with 12, 15, 30 credits, and so they're, they're already building towards their status. Um, so if you think about the two classes that are m most impacted by this would be our m most recent cohort, so fall of 20 cohort freshmen and, and fall of 19 who were impacted at the very end uh, or the start of the pandemic, but at the end of their academic year. And so those are the two groups that we're seeing come through. Um, also our uh, transfer numbers last year were down. And so that, that is an element that we're managing. So they would typically fall into that sophomore, junior, uh, probably now senior status. And so, yeah, there's a lot of elements that are pulling towards this, um, both from an input from a new student enrollment and some the historical uh, things that have happened that we're now seeing firsthand and then the most immediate in terms of, of student departure. Dr. Johnson, I'm sorry. Did somebody else have a question? Go ahead, Renato. Uh, so and I'm curious about the junior as well. Um, with the Tennessee Promise, have we seen that uh, it has impacted the number of uh, community college students that, that are not going on to get a four-year degree that perhaps 
before if they had started out at a four-year university they might have finished and maybe that's an impossible question to to answer but I just uh, I just wonder uh, how well those students that, that have chosen to go to the community college have done toward then following up at a four-year institution. Yeah, that, that's definitely a trend we're seeing. So uh, the promise uh, sort of initially changed the game of enrollment, right? Who, who comes in and, and what we experience. And, and the thought of the, the promise is they go to community college for two years and then we'll see an influx of transfers. Uh, that, that hasn't been realized, not at Tech and not, not across the state necessarily. And so uh, in those moments, we also see that community colleges, especially last year and then again this year, we see a decline in their enrollment. And so uh, sort of the pool of, of prospects that we can transfer in are, are declining. And so uh, we have been very intentional. Uh, we we um, have mentioned the Rhone to Tech uh, program where we're very deliberate with Roan State students and and really eliminating all barriers and also uh, from a from a, psycho a psychological standpoint not thinking that they're stopping <laughs> we've got to keep these students programmed from from point of entry if it's Roan State um, to Tennessee Tech and and so uh, immediately advising them in that manner uh, making sure that they understand that uh, we are we are a cohesive unit uh, even though we're two separate institutions and two separate entities uh, because I think too often students believe there's a time to pause uh, or a time to reflect and um, and I don't believe that's in, in the best interest of their uh, bachelor degree obtainment we, we need them to believe and, and to understand that the next step is to continue on and to complete their bachelor degree and so the less barriers they have or or actually the um, uh, the more formal we eliminate any of those transitional issues uh, is what we're trying to accomplish and so Rhone Tech was our first go at this uh, very early we'll, we'll have um, you know we started this in July in, in the new cohort but you, you're right on there, there are there are some circumstances around the promise that were uh, that didn't come as we thought they would uh, but at the same time we have our we have our work cut out for us to make sure that those that are at the community college uh, move on and, and transition into a bachelor degree program you know trustee rose uh, I mean Brandon wasn't here at the time first year of Tennessee promise we saw a 15 percent drop in our freshman class Okay, we have we've seen essentially no increase in transfer numbers since that time. So, and I think that's we probably saw a bigger hit on our freshman class than some other institutions did, but nobody's seen an increase in transfer numbers. So, I think your the answer to your question is no. We're not. You know, it hasn't. Uh, it has impacted probably some students that would have been pursuing a four-year degree previously. Dr. Oldham, is it true that University of Tennessee has co-opted that promise for their own needs to bring freshmen onto campus, uh, to the University of Tennessee campuses? Because of this very reason, people are trying to create their own Tennessee promise because, I mean, what I would have rather had, and I think I told you this in a faculty meeting, why not just give that promise to any freshman at any state school? Um, if that's what we're trying to do is encourage people to go on uh, for education. So we, we did take that hit and others are now changing their system to mock the Tennessee promise to take that um, enrollment back. Yeah, so so you're right. Uh, the UT system maybe two years ago now uh, initiated a, uh, a UT promise uh, for lower, lower income uh, freshmen uh, similar in nature to the Tennessee Promise. Uh, we we initiated our own last year. I know, uh, Dr. Johnson, you may want to comment on that if we've seen any impact of that at all. Uh, but uh, yeah, and so uh, to, to your question, I mean, it could make a difference. But a actually, interestingly, this year, and it may be a COVID effect as well. Uh, the, uh, the, the college going rate for high school graduates in Tennessee dropped for the first time since Tennessee Promise was initiated by about five points, pretty substantially, so. Just curious, it seems like then the Tennessee Promise may actually be having the opposite effect. Have, if, if college going students dropped a significant factor, what about college graduates? Is that also declining? Uh, 
not yet. Uh, I think the problem you get into with this is, you know, there are leading indicators and there are lagging indicators, and and oftentimes you you, you may not know the eventual impact of this till five or six years down the road. So, uh, could it have? Yeah, it could have that impact. Uh, we, it's, I think it's just too soon to tell. Dr. Johnson, I had a different kind of a question. Just administratively, the question about juniors and seniors is really interesting, and, and I'm so glad uh, Trustee Van Hooser brought that question up about the juniors. Is that is, is retention part of your responsibility, or is that a different place in the university? It's part of my responsibility. Okay, great. So Thank you. It, it is a, um, a comprehensive, so our, our, our uh, there's various departments that are sort of pulling these students from an engagement standpoint from Student Live, uh, the Provost Office, and Academic Affairs. So we all play a, a, a distinct role in it um, and, and have many conversations about it. Uh, but the day-to-day -day focus, um, you know, I think President Oldham would say, sort of looks to me to make sure that we're, we're tracking this and that we're, we're making it, uh, necessary moves. Yeah, let me comment real quick on that. So if we're not careful as an institution, things like this, things like retention, it, it's, you kind of fall in a category of every, everybody's problem becomes nobody's responsibility. And That's exactly so, why I asked the question. And so, you know, Dr. Johnson's exactly right. And I do look to him to, to play the lead role in this. But a lot of, I mean, everybody on campus is involved in this to one extent or, or another. And so it's very important, but I, you know, I think it's important that we have somebody that's uh, getting up every morning thinking about student retention and, and helping drive student success. And so that's, that's why we're structured the way we are. All right, so uh, just to complete this slide discussion, uh, in the bottom right-hand corner of the, of the, is the 3.4%. Again, I just wanna connect that back to the, the first slide uh, that sh showed our comparison to other LGIs. Just one comment, I just, while we're talking about negative things, I wanted to say it's fantastic to see the doctoral programs increasing and the education specialist, and I hope that, that especially the doc PhD programs continue to be on the rise because I think that would be very beneficial to the university. I appreciate that, Tom, because, you know, despite the overall enrollment decline here, which uh, is, is concerning, and, and uh, Dr. Johnson will tell you all the things we're doing about that, th there is some good news hidden in here, too, and I, I appreciate you pulling that out. You know, the, uh, as Dr. Johnson said, the transfer numbers are up this year. Uh, hopefully we can sustain that. But the graduate school continues to, to do much, much better, and uh, particularly at the doctoral level, which is good. And, and the research dollar numbers reflect that as well. So, and we'll get into that later, probably. Dr. Johnson, uh, on your first slide, when you showed that TSU's enrollment was actually up, um, they used their HERF funds, which is the higher education relief funds from COVID, to buy back debt from students at other at institutions. They were basically almost buying transfers. Um, so also Nashville is home to more people. So I think people who chose to, to endure college and during COVID at home. Have we used our HERF funds? Are we using our HERF funds to help students and, and in a way that they know that the HERF funds are a reward for sticking with it? Yeah, we, uh, about uh, probably three weeks ago now, we dispersed our, the last pool of funds we have for students, uh, upwards of $11 million. Um, that was 100% to the students, for the students. Uh, we simply uh, collected the money and, and passed it through us to them. Um, and I think they've been very appreciative of that uh, with some guidance on, on what you can use it for. Uh, so this, um, you know, this last round was much more flexible for them in terms of, uh, you know, in, in encouraging them if they have sort of debt for tuition that you could use this, you know, you go ahead and make this payment um, to help you through that. So we, we've done 100% of the funds for the students is out to the students at this point. Um, and so we're thankful for the support and, and to get those to the students. And I think many of them 
Um, it, is, it has saved them in a lot of ways um, from, from food to rent to electricity, uh, not just simply you know, paying for education and continuing to enroll. Yeah, one, one important point, Trustee Alcott, is uh, the, the, and Dr. Stinson can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the HBCUs had a different set of guidelines uh, in how they could use HERP funds. We were, uh, the rest of us were fairly restricted in how we could apply those funds. Uh, and so we, we could not, we were uh, prohibited from using those to actually go toward student debt at the institution. And I, Dr. Stinson, do you want to comment on that? So one of the things that happened in the first round of the CARES funds is the uh, historically black institutions had a separate pot of money, which was really significant. And I think that's actually the dollars that a lot of those uh, institutions, including TSU, used uh, to help with some of the debt that already had been incurred by their students, but also to help them going forward. But that was a totally separate pot of CARES money that was not given to any of the other institutions. Uh, yeah, I'm certainly not criticizing us in this way, but I know that they were pretty strate strategic in going after transfer students. So sometimes it's not just the way you use, or that you have the money and that you used it, but they literally used it to their advantage against maybe some of us. Um, and I congratulate them for their, for their cleverness, but I, it's, uh, you know, that's reflecting that, that, that's a big bump that they saw for a couple of reasons which is okay, but it put us at a little bit of a disadvantage. Yeah, the, the other, just anecdotally, uh, really hearing both from TSU and UT Knoxville, their enrollment growth is primarily out-of-state students. And that's a, that's a market that we uh, are still attempting to get into. Uh, we're in our, in, I'd say we're in our infancy in that regard, but uh, I think, uh, the institutions that did fare better this year are those that had outreach out of state uh, and whatever lessons we can learn from that. I did meet at least one student last night who had come here from Kentucky in our, um, in our uh, diversity scholarship recipients and he was very impressive, so that was good. All right, I'm gonna move on to the, the major initiatives that we have, uh, we're actively uh, implementing or tracking. Uh, just to note, the fall 22 goals remain. We will enroll 2,000 new freshmen, 800 new transfers, and have 82% freshman retention rate. We're committed to that. As of Tuesday um, of this week, from a new student recruitment standpoint, we are 3.5% up in freshman applications um, over two years ago, which was, which was the high mark, and 13% up um, in admits. And so we uh, start this year in a, a very favorable place. Um, this is actually, both numbers are the highest marks we've had in early uh, October. And, um, and although we, we uh, are glad for that, uh, we also fully embrace that we need to drive applications and MITs even higher to set us up for success for the fall. I'm gonna go through and share with you the six major initiatives that we are aggressively moving forward to get us back to growing our enrollment. We are live with our new guaranteed scholarship program called Presidential Scholars which provides more students with more money. We have built the scholarship program to align with our strategic goals while analyzing the programs of other state universities to ensure we create a program of significance. We need to, we need to influence high quality students to apply and enroll at Tech. New freshmen who apply for admission by December 15th and meet the minimum qualifications will automatically be awarded the scholarship. The new Presidential Scholars Program provides $5,000 to students with a 3.75 high school GPA and a 33 ACT. It provides $4,000 to students with a 3.4 high school GPA and a 24 ACT, and $3,000 to students with a 3.4 and 22 to 23 ACT. 
uh, I believe you have the material for uh, uh, the presidential scholars. Uh, you've been provided that. So I encourage you to look through this. Um, to understand the full program. Yeah, Dr. if you could, could you just quickly give the board an idea about how this compares to what we've done previously? So the, the, the most uh, impactful change uh, with this program is not just the scholarship amount, but the process to obtain the scholarship. So these are guaranteed. So they, uh, upon admission, they will be provided and notified of the amount that they receive. And so there's no further action by them. They've earned it, uh, and we're gonna provide it to them. So that's, that's going to uh, obviously be well received with the students and the parents. But from a, but from a sort of the numbers of this, uh, previously 3.75 GPA and above were the only students who were getting uh, a merit-based scholarship like this. Uh, if they had a 33 or better, they received $5,000, which is actually the same as it is in the presidential scholars. But below, the, below this is where we see the most movement. From a 31 to a 32, they received a 4,000, 4, and from a 27 to a 30, a 3,000. And so uh, if you had less than a 3.75, uh, less than a 3.75 GPA and lower than a 27 ACT, you are not receiving any merit-based aid. Uh, now we are at a 3.4 um, and a 22. So more students receive more money, guaranteed. And so are, there, are there any uh, requirements for performance after arriving here? I mean, you may have said it, I missed it, but. Yeah, we, we have, so after three terms, after three semesters, we will look at their GPA, and they each, each level has a specific GPA that they have to maintain. And is this for in-state residents, or is it whoever? This is for any, any freshman could be eligible. I have a 17-year-old at home. That's why I was asking. But you're a Tennessee resident, so it's okay. Yeah. We've, in, we've invested in, uh, in, in coordination with this, the scholarship program, the Presidential Scholars Program. We've invested in scholarship-focused marking strategy with enhanced, it's personal and putting students first messaging. Our uh, Office of Marketing and Communication has taken an aggressive approach, which includes billboards, television commercials, digital and traditional marketing and advertising, targeted messaging and geofencing. This message uses clear, direct language to provide more scholarships for more students. Uh, we'd like to share with you the commercial. You can't predict the future, but you can count on Tennessee Tech always putting students first. Our faculty, staff, and students have shown strength, compassion, patience, and kindness during these trying times. I'm a college president, and Carrie and I are also the proud parents of a Tennessee Tech student. We want every student to be treated as we want our own son to be treated. We understand today's challenges and put the focus on student success. For us, it's personal. That's what you can count on at Tennessee Tech. Tennessee Tech puts students first with new guaranteed scholarships. I'm Tech President Phil Oldham, introducing the Presidential Scholars Program. Now Tech has more scholarships for more students. Visit tntech.edu slash wings up. So you can see firsthand the energy uh, that we're creating with this program. And uh, as we engage students, it's being well received uh, within the marketplace thus far. And it will not only uh, help us generate the applications and the uh, admitted students we desire, but it will also impact our yield of those admitted students as we uh, further engage them financially. Trailblazers, uh, this is our student recruitment, our student recruitment um, group, are building personalized, meaningful connections by engaging prospective students via social media, email, phone calls, and showcasing campi campus while families visit. Let me summarize their impact with a quote directly from one of our visitors. The visitor said, we immediately had a great first impression with the gentleman who did the overview with the uh, presentation at the beginning. He was very knowledgeable and friendly. Then our trailblazers were Ellie and Casey. 
I, cannot I can't even explain how wonderful they were. They pretty much sold us on tech life and the campus and the community. They were so genuine and welcoming and sweet and great at what they do. This entire experience was the best campus tour we have had, we have, had, we have been on yet, and has pushed tech up even further on our list. Such a great experience. This is one of many we have received. This feedback provides, uh, proves that this intentional effort to connect prospective students with our current students is the right strategy. Student engagement tracking created a personalized post-visit experience for, for prospective students that our admissions counselors meet during high school visit and college fairs. This, this keeps these students, especially the seniors, at the forefront of our follow-up follow -up to drive and track applications and campus visits. These metrics allow us to ensure quality assurance of our external visits by individual admissions counselors. In, in September, of the students we collected contact information on, 373 have applied and 140 have set up campus visits. As of the summer, we are now fully implemented with the Launchpad Student Success Center. Launchpad staff connect with new students during SOAR and then continue to support them throughout the fall and spring semesters. They look to proactively identify and address a variety of student issues, build meaningful relationships with each student, ensure they are taking the appropriate classes that put them on track to graduate, and hold programs from career readiness to time management that support the student's success. They also refer students across campus to get the specialized support they require. The primary focus of the flight path is to encourage consistent class attendance and participation by freshmen. Students with documented course absences, uh, absence concerns will receive early peer-to-peer -peer intervention from, a trained, from trained members of the residence life and student success student staffs to ensure the, students, the student is connected with faculty, staff, and services specifically allocated to facilitate their success. I thank you for this opportunity to share the major initiatives uh, and I'm definitely happy to answer any additional questions the committee or the board may have. I'm curious about the new tuition structure that we've implemented. If you've heard any, I mean, what the general consensus, the comments that you hear. Uh, so the general consensus, especially now that it's rolled out, is, is sort of, uh, they, they didn't know any different, uh, right? So the new students coming in, um, they see this as uh, sort of a standard of which they, they expect. You know, once we get them to full time, that we don't, um, we don't sort of nickel and dime them as they want to take classes from, from uh, you know, from 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 credit hours. So it's, it's been well received, it's transparent, uh, it's easy to talk with students and families about this is what it's going to cost, and and without the caveat of depending on what how many number of courses you take. And so uh, the students, uh, we haven't heard any negative feedback. Um, it, typically, you know, it, the the response is thank you for being transparent and uh, making it as clean as possible, uh, so we can focus on all the other things that tech has to offer and not trying to figure out your tuition model. And so. Um, it's well received in that regard, and the more we can make transparency the focus, um, you know, the cost is the cost, uh, but when we make it about the cost and them trying to sort of obsess about trying to figure out the cost, the less time we have and the less focus they have on our programs academically, our, our community, all these things that we offer. And so uh, for that, it's, it's eliminated that barrier. We're very transparent. We're very upfront, um, and, and it's been well received in terms of the transparency of it. Well, that's encouraging. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Just a quick comment. I wanted to compliment you a lot on these new programs and initiatives. I had four children and toured many, many colleges. And two things that impressed me the most in touring different colleges is one is the clarity and how much is it going to cost, or, or at least not so much how much it's going to cost, but what, what is the scholarship? situation and I think the Presidential Scholars Program is fantastic in that regard. The second thing is the tours. I think the tours, you know, all of my children, they chose a college not based on necessarily, well, somewhat the programs or statistics or anything. They, they chose colleges based on how they felt there. 
and how they felt there is hugely impacted by the tour guides. And so I think all the effort you can put towards that, it's a, a low cost way to really improve your impression for incoming potential freshmen. So anyway, Ed, I think the, I shouldn't do it, but I, I, I love the, the video. I just have to tease the marketing department just a little bit. Uh, Dr. Oldham, when you are petting your dog, you're saying, I have a student in, here in college at Tennessee Tech. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could edit that a little differently. <laughs> well, I, I don't think my son wanted, me in, wanted to be in the commercial and me pet him on the head. So I, it, uh... I've already told Dr. Oldham the dog should be credited for all appearances. <laughs> I wanted to thank the board actually for the, the, the fee structure is so helpful for students. We have students who they come, they're paying for their 13 hours. They want to take more classes. There are people who want to be more involved and if it's um, prohibitive cost wise, that's really a problem for us because um, we want those students who have broad access to the campus. So that's a great thing. Very good. Any other comments or questions? Yes, uh, I concur uh, completely with all the other trustees, but I have a question, Dr. Johnson, because um, it's had such a positive impact on students. Have you seen any impact on um, the other colleges or departments here at Tech, with especially having to move just a little fundings around and it might um, maybe hinder by chance? Are you uh, about the uh, tuition model? Yeah, so like how the tuition is moved around just a little and it's great for students getting one good lump sum, you know what you're getting, but has it affected the department, say business department or uh, biology or any, because certain students won't take certain classes and how the funds are moved? I'm going to invite Provost Bruce to the podium to answer that. That's a okay. great question. Uh, and I don't admit when I, when I don't have the answer. So I, I will invite Provost Bruce to this. So thank you, Trustee Willis, for that question, because you provided the perfect segue into my comments. Um, one of, the, one of the, the changes that we've seen in academic affairs is a, exactly what the tuition model was designed to do. Um, in my recollection, that flat rate tuition model had two primary purposes. One, to make it clear to the incoming student how much it cost to come to Tennessee Tech, make it easier for them to navigate, not just not just incoming students, but existing current students, making it easier for them to navigate the finances and to encourage them to progress in their degree program at a rate that gets them toward graduation quicker. Um, and we did a lot of analysis behind that to ensure that that student academic success would be positively impacted by that. And we have seen that. And so one of the, one of the outcomes of that is that we do see a, a, um, a higher rate of graduation of students. We also, see, and I'll comment on that in a, little bit, a little bit more, but we also see that when we have the same, when we count bodies, when we do a head count of our student, another way that we count in academic affairs, the way we measure um, productivity is through student credit hour production, right? So a student might take one course for three credit hours. A student might take 15 credit hours full time. So when we look at a head count, the head count is not always a perfect indicator of student credit hour production. And so from the instructional side, we see more instruction for the same amount of students because they're enrolling in more student credit hours. And so that's kind of a hidden effect. We feel that, we know that in academic affairs, but that's, that, that was by design. That was by design. We want our students to progress toward their degree in, a, in an efficient, but also in an effective way. So we wanted to make sure their academic success is positive, positively impacted, but they also progress toward graduation because we know 
every year that a student is delayed from graduation, that's a delay of their being in their career and earning a, an income. So th does that help answer your question? Yes, absolutely, thank you. The, that also ties back to, to uh, Dr. Johnson's table um, about the enrollments and the head counts and those different classification levels. I think uh, it, it's not exactly a, an issue of retention. So when we look at the head count of students and we look at say, oh, the number of seniors might be down, that's not necessarily an indicator that we had a retention issue with seniors. All that's telling us is we have fewer seniors this year than we had last year. It could be a retention. That could be we had fewer juniors last year. So if we look back at our enrollments, when we have a dip in freshman enrollments, that dip works its way through the system. The other aspect is that we might be graduating more people. And this past year, we had record numbers of graduates. One in four of all of our students earned a degree last year. I, mean, I want people to think about that. One in four of all of our students earned a degree. That's an amazing metric for a state public institution. Um, when I look at the number of people who graduated per FTE students, and I say FTE because that's a full-time equivalent, we would expect a part-time student to take longer to graduate. But when I look at the number of graduates per FTE students, it's 28% last year. That's a pretty significant increase from previous years. So that's great from academic affairs. That's a great um, metric of success. That's almost one in three. We're, 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 we're almost getting, we're, we're inching up from one in four to one in three. What that does though, is it creates a little vacuum on the backside in our enrollment numbers. So every time we successfully graduate a student, we've got to replace that student with another one. So when we look at those enrollment tables, I would encourage you to keep that, all of that in mind. We, we were extremely successful this past year with educating our students, getting them graduated. We had, part of that was, excuse me, I'm gonna get a drink. Part of that was big summer schools. The last two summers we've had very large enrollments in summer school. Well, part of that's because of COVID. Uh, students had less opportunity for internships, less opportunities to travel abroad, and so they took more summer classes. That helped them, that also helped them progress toward graduation. So we had an absolutely six, fantastic year last year in educating our students, successfully getting them graduated, um, but that does create a little bit of a vacuum on the backside in our enrollment numbers. That makes it even more important to work on those <clears throat> incoming students into the pipeline. Um, so that was a little ad hoc, that was a little side note from my, what I prepared to talk about, but, but um, it's important to celebrate our successes and we really did have a lot of students graduate. Um, I'll just leave you with that metric. One in four of our students graduated with a degree last year. Provost Bruce, I think I'll interrupt at this point and say, Dr. Johnson, thank you for your report, very much so. And unless there are any other questions, we'll just transition on to Provost Bruce with that question, if that's okay. Any other questions for Dr. Johnson? All right, thank you again very much. And Provost Bruce, I think you're going to give us a, uh, update on academic affairs and including the academic uh, success model yeah. metrics. So, good morning. Um, welcome, everyone. I have kind of two uh, primary uh, items that I want to talk about today. One is just fall, how this fall is playing out in terms of instruction, uh, our course delivery to the students this fall. Um, especially in light of the pandemic, and then give you a very, very quick update on our fifth year interim report for our SAC COC University accreditation. Um, this fall, our faculty are teaching a little over 3,500 course sections. Um, actually, it's 3,651, but who's counting? So a little over 3,500 course sections. 
and that's generating a little, uh, right at 130,000 student credit hours. About 80% of those course sections are at the uh, undergraduate level, with 20% being at the graduate level. Now this is showing a, a, a little bit of a shift, a slight shift in our instruction from undergraduate to graduate, but that's not surprising. Um, over the past few years, we've seen a decline in our undergrad enrollment and an increase in our graduate enrollment, so we should be seeing that shift in our instruction. Um, another interesting aspect of this fall's uh, course offerings is the delivery modality. And I've, I'm going to focus a little bit of attention on that because that's been the biggest disruptive change in academic fairs as a result of COVID-19. Um, you know, I'm sure you all know we talked about that pivot to all online in spring of 2020, and then we had to plan for fall of 2020 and going forward. And in fall of 2020, our goal, and we reached it, was to have about a third of our courses in person, a third online, and a third hybrid. Um, where a hybrid is a kind of a, a flexible mix of in-person and online activities. So we did that one third, one third, one third. We moved into spring and we achieved 55% um, in person, 15% uh, online, and 25% hybrid. And this fall, we uh, have transitioned our mix of instruction to 72% fully in person, 12% online, and 16% hybrid. So 72%, around two thirds to three fourths of our classes are fully in person this fall. Now that mixture varies significantly from undergrad to grad. Um, our graduate courses, if I look at all of our graduate sections, more than two thirds are online. When I look at our freshman courses, 5% are online. So we really, really worked throughout the spring and summer to make sure we were delivering the best mix of courses, not just in terms of content and what people needed to make progress toward their degree, but in the delivery modality of those courses. Um, you know, one thing that's easy to forget, and it's easy for me to forget for sure, is how far in advance we work on these class schedules. You know, this fall's course schedule was designed and built out last January and February. And hindsight's 2020, but if I roll my mind back to last January and I think about how uncertain we were, we were hopeful, but very in uncertain about what this fall, how this fall would end up being. And so I just really wanna commend the department chairs, the deans, the faculty for being creative, being flexible, being agile, and really working on those class schedules so that when we came into this fall, we would be prepared for no matter what we faced. Um, so we really uh, uh, take great pride in how in person we've provided the educational experience, particularly for our undergrads this, this fall. Um, we surveyed students, faculty. We had focus groups with students and faculty. We, uh, we looked at, we, we, we gathered input from a variety of ways and both anecdotally and through formal uh, mechanisms, the students and faculty communicated two messages to us last year. One, we need more graduate courses and graduate programs online to provide access to more graduate students to our graduate programs. And we need to transition our undergraduate courses back to in-person as soon as safely possible. That's what our students and faculty in general were telling us. When I looked at how our students' academic performance was last year, that academic performance correlated very highly to what the students and faculty were telling us. Um, on pages 13 and 14 of your diligent book, your academic and student affairs book, I think it's tab 4.2, there's some tables in there where you will find some kind of high level overviews of student academic success. And there's two metrics that I pay a lot of attention to. These are kind of national standards in terms of student academic success. One's an obvious one, GPA. 
And so we, when I talk about GPA, I'm not talking about an individual student's GPA, I'm talking about their collective GPA. And then something called a DFW rate. That is the percentage of grades earned that are either a D, a F, or a withdrawal. Now the reason those two metrics are both important is because imagine a course where almost all the students, I mean, I'm, I'm making up a very, uh, you know, extreme case, but you have a course where almost everybody withdraws. Well, the ones remaining might have a great GPA. So you have to look at the GPA and the DFW rate to kind of get a fuller picture of how student success is looking. Now, just because a student withdraws doesn't mean they withdrew for academic reasons. It may have been financial, it may have been health related, you know, it may have been family related. There's a variety of reasons, but regardless, they, they withdraw from that course. So we look at that DFW rate um, to look at student success. So when I looked back at last fall compared to the previous two years, the overall GPA and DFW rate of our students was almost exactly what it was the previous two years. So as an aggregate, our students' academic performance was just as high as ever last fall and last spring. When I dig deeper, it's pretty consistent, even across freshman courses, sophomore. The, there's a little variation in there, but very little. Where we did see variation is when we drilled down into the academic performance as a function of delivery modality. So when you look at, say, upperclassmen, it, there wasn't much variation. Whether they took the course in person or online, they performed about the same as they always have. But the freshmen and sophomores were impacted. Their academic performance did vary based on the delivery modality, which exactly correlated to what the students and faculty were verbally telling us. So that is why we, we went to great lengths to ensure that this fall, our course deliveries were designed in a way that really gave the students the highest opportunity for success. Um, and I will say, to make that happen, took a lot of creativity and ingenuity on the department's parts, the faculty's parts. Um, so, you know, we are holding classes in rooms we wouldn't normally hold classes in. We are holding classes at times of day that is not the norm for this campus. We took large sections of freshman and sophomore classes and split them into smaller groups so that they could meet in person safely. We didn't know what the social distancing requirements were gonna be this fall, so we were doing all this back in February. So we, we went to great lengths, and I will say that the new lab sciences building and the Stone Cipher Lecture Hall, you know, uh, saved our bacon, for lack of a better term. I mean, giving us those extra large classrooms and those auditorium, large rooms where we could safely spread out and have students feel safe about enrolling in class and being able to spread out and not, not be kind of compressed into a room together, that really made a very significant impact on our ability to meet our goals this fall in our course offerings. Um, so I just wanna say one more time how thankful I am for the department chairs who most of the, do, does most of the heavy lifting on the course schedule build out, the faculty and their tenacity and willingness to to teach into the evening, teach in places they don't normally teach, to make that a reality for our students. Um, I just really, really want to commend them. And then, uh, I, I guess I'll take questions on that before I go into the SAC COC. If, are there any questions or, or feedback on, on those points that I made? Any trustees have any questions or comments? Doesn't look so. Go ahead then, thank you. Okay, and then my last item is our SAC COC fifth year interim report. Um, as, you, as you know, this is very important to our campus, our SAC COC accreditation. We are preparing for the submission of our kind of what we call a, a mid-tenure, a mid-review report, um, but I don't want to make that sound like a small undertaking. We have a committee of about 50 people working on this report 
headed by a group of 10 individuals who were predominantly uh, associate provosts, deans, associate deans, uh, department chairs. Um, so those, that 10 member committee has been working very, very diligently. They are led by Dr. Ho, associate provost, and they have done an outstanding job. Um, in the board book, you'll see a little timeline. And even since the submission of this, of course, we submit our documents a couple of weeks in advance. Even since the submission of this, um, we've now all of the rows of that table are in the green. And so every one of our standards and our narratives are either have gone through their second revision or are currently under their second revision. Uh, we gave ourselves about a three month buffer in the preparation of this, and I'm very pleased that we, we probably will not need that. The report is due in March of 2022, and so we are closing in on that date, and um, I'm very confident that we will have an excellent report to present to SAC COC in the March of 2022. Any comments or questions? Thank you. Thank you, Provost Bruce. Next, we have uh, Dr. Cynthia Pope Johnson. Good to have you with us this morning, uh, Dr. John Pope Johnson, and you're going to provide us an update on student affairs. Yeah, good to have you here today. Thank you. I hope you're enjoying Tennessee Tech. I am. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, to the board and to President Oldham. Thank you so much for having me. It is an, indeed a pleasure to be here. I've been here three months, and so we are already starting to have fun over in the area of student affairs, and we're being very strategic about our new initiatives and programs that we'd like to see happen. Uh, let me start by saying, um, over the past three months, I've been able to visit with many different colleagues many different students and stakeholders around campus uh, to learn just what's working in our area in terms of student affairs. Uh, as we, as you probably well know, student affairs, our concentration is primarily on the out of class experience for students. And so we're looking at ways in which our student experience can be better. And so that's really our focus. Let me tell you that the functional areas that fall within our division include Accessible Education Center, Counseling Center, our Dean of Students Office, which encompasses student conduct, student activities, SGA, and Greek life, uh, our Eagle Card Office, Health Services, Multicultural Affairs, and the Black Cultural Center, uh, the Mark L. Burnett Recreation and Fitness Center, Residential Life, University Service Center, and University Police. So we have many different departments that contribute to the out-of-classroom experience for our students. Um, basically, I've spent these first 90 days really focusing on our resources. So in looking at our staffing models, we're pretty lean in comparison to some other institutions. However, we're doing great work. Our staff members are committed to the work. They're dedicated to Tennessee Tech University. And so half of the battle is already um, you know, accomplished. Uh, we are certainly moving ahead. But with that, I've been looking at our human and our financial resources just to see how well we're using those resources, where the gaps in services lie, and then where we may need to reallocate resources or advocate for new resources to do the work that we really want to do. With these programs and services, you probably realize that we offer a lot of services uh, that complement the academic mission of the university. And so what we want to do is also align well with partners around the country. So one of the things I've been able to do is provide the CAS standards for all of our directors in our units. CAS stands for the Council for the Advancement of Standards in Higher Education. And so we want to be the experts in our field. We actually want to be a model of excellence when it comes to student affairs divisions around the country. We want to be the school that other divisions look at and say, what's tech doing? And so we've been talking about that with many of our departments and our um, staff leads and our staffs in each area. 
The number two area that we've really focused on recently is student engagement. So one of the things I heard during my interview uh, was that students were going home a lot on campuses, that this was pretty much considered a suitcase campus. One of the things we've been able to roll out is an initiative called College Town Weekends. College Town Weekends is an opportunity for students to engage more with their peers, more with faculty, staff, and other stakeholders in the community. So we've been able to compile uh, many different activities and events that are are happening within Cookville, but also on campus, looking at ways that we can highlight our athletic events, other social opportunities, and ways for students to stay here on weekends and not feel like they have to go home. Um, we feel like we're off to a great start. We have a long way to go. We're certainly working with our residential life program uh, to be able to enhance that experience for students. And last but not least, we're looking at our model around health, wellness, and well-being. Let me say that it is important, as you well know, uh, with COVID and many other issues uh, plaguing our nation right now, it is very important to look at how we're servicing our students when it comes to health and wellness and their overall well-being. Um, beyond COVID, we have students who struggle with financial issues that may be due to um, you know, some, some issues around their financial aid or perhaps uh, issues at home. Uh, some students, as you well know, if you look at the data and trends in higher education, um, on average, there's about a 25% um, when you look at higher education as a whole, you're looking at uh, students dealing with homelessness or food insecurity. So we're looking at ways that we can provide more of an integrated model when we look at health, wellness, and well-being for our students. So that's looking at how we collaborate across departments and not operate in a silo fashion in terms of health services, um, recreation and fit fitness, uh, accessible, accessible education center, and also with counseling center. Um, we're looking at all of those areas to determine how we provide a better experience for our students in that fashion. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to entertain them. But those are the three big focus areas in which I've been focused on for the past 90 days. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Are there any questions or comments? I just have a comment, and I should have said this earlier, too. In addition to our reception last evening, we had a tour of a dorm, and it was the first time I've been in a dorm in a lot of years, 30-something. And uh, I was very, very impressed with what you all are doing with housing, and I was even more impressed with what your student RAs and your staff that led the tour. I thought that was just tremendous. So thank you for enabling that. And I think we're having lunch today in the cafeteria to give us another little bit of experience of what students are living with. And you listed that big long list of things, Dr. Polk Johnson, and I don't know how you get to sleep, but I'm glad that we have you. <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, certainly we have uh, some gr really great students at Residential Life, staff as well. Our RAs are just phenomenal in the work that they provide. Uh, we want to provide a, a even better experience for students when they um, live on campus. So we're looking at that as well. You probably know that we've posted for an executive director of university housing and residence life so that we can build a model, again, that is, uh, that is a spotlight <laughs> for us at Tennessee Tech but also a model for our institutions across the country. Any other comments for Dr. Pope Johnson? Yeah, just a comment. I appreciate the, the focus on high standards and being an example. I also just, just the focus areas I think are, are really right. And, and last night we got a chance to spend time with some of the students and some of the feedback I heard from them was, yeah, we, 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 we want to stay here on the weekends. We want stuff to do for us on the weekends that you know, makes it something that attracts us to the campus and to the city. So I think that's great. And I think it's also a great way to connect the students and the, to the broader community. So thanks for, for, for focusing in that area. Thank you, Trustee Lowry. You mentioned um, staffing. Do you have a comparison numbers for a university of our size or what other university might have as far as staffing? Is that what you're referring to, the number of staff? Yes, so when we look at other institutions, LGIs specifically, uh, most of the, 
Our, our staff is very lean in a lot of different areas when you look at, particularly our student engagement area. Uh, we have some great staff in that area that's doing Greek life and, you know, working with the 20 sororities and fraternities that we currently have, as well as over 200 student organizations. Uh, but most of those offices have a minimum of six professional staff members. Uh, we're a little short in that area. We're doing great work, uh, but I realized that if we had a few more hands uh, in that area, we could be doing even better work. How many so do we have? Excuse me? Sorry to interrupt. How many do we have? Sure. Uh, when, and, and when I refer to professional staff, I'm looking at those that directly do the student activities and student engagement. Right now we have two, three, two to three individuals uh, in that area. And so on average, you're looking at five to six at a minimum uh, to do that kind of work. And so I think, you know, this is an area we have an opportunity for growth in. Um, and so we're looking at that in particular. Our residential life model, uh, there was a study done as uh, prior to my arrival um, that showed that we were a little bit understaffed in that area as well. So we're, again, we posted for an executive director for University Housing and Residence Life. Uh, and we've been able to add a new staff member over there through re reclassification. Michelle Huddleston is now serving as our associate director for service learning, leadership development, and residential education. So that expands her role in terms of service learning, but also gives us that extra support in residence life to provide the programming for our students and for our staff. So we're looking at ways that, hey, we have resources, we have great people, how can we reallocate? And then again, where do we need to advocate for, for, for new resources? I think that reflects well on the President's comments earlier to Dr. Johnson, everybody is involved in retention, and this is a huge issue. So if you're understaffed, keep telling us. Sure, <laughs> appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Let, me, let, me, let me just add real quick. Uh, campus life is a big part of our overall strategic plan, and uh, I can't say enough how much I appreciate Dr. Pope Johnson joining us, and I can assure everybody she hit the ground running, as I think you can probably already tell. And if anything, she's probably ahead of schedule. So um, she's, uh, she's doing a great job and I uh, really appreciate her being here. So thank you. And your enthusiasm you. is contagious, so <laughs> keep it up. It's very good. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Just one question. We, we've often commented and been concerned about diversity. And I think one of the concerns is that minority students, I, I want them to feel welcome and not just welcome, but that we want them here. So how, how is that being improved as far as student affairs, student life goes? Sure, uh, this is another area in which we are looking at our staffing model in terms of multicultural affairs and our black cultural center. I have a huge vision and, and I've already shared that with President Odom um, and we're talking about how we can make that vision a reality. Uh, when you look at our students of color, um, we have, you know, a, probably I think around 12% currently, but the goal is to get up to 22% by 2025. So with that being the case, we certainly want to see how we can bring more students of color under the umbrella of multicultural affairs, or what I like to call intercultural affairs, um, so that our students can begin to um, really feel welcome and really feel like there is a critical mass of students of color on campus. We are being very strategic. I've already met with, uh, of course, the director of that unit, Ms. Charia Campbell. I've met with Dr. Owens many times to talk through this as well. And, and we have standing meetings on the calendar, on our calendars to talk about diversity. Um, so we know that access is part of our you know, our ongoing goals. And so as we increase our numbers, we want to make sure that our students also get here, uh, find their niche, uh, and find their place. One of the things I've found in higher education is that when we recruit a student of color, we recruit a family of color. So we don't just recruit that student. We must find ways in which the families feel comfortable and that they feel like it's a home away from home for our students of color. So we're looking at ways to do that, uh, even with our physical space in the center, uh, but also with the services and programs that we provide. Thank you so much. We're so glad you're here. 
Anybody else? Very good. Thank you and great report and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. We'll next go to uh, Dr. Kevin Braswell. He's going to give us the uh, university advancement report, including uh, some information on how we're doing on annual fundraising and some of the future initiatives. Good to have you with us today, Dr. Braswell. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Chair Rose, members of the board, President Oldham, thank you so much for the opportunity to share a brief update on university advancement. The central message I bring to you this morning is this. The university had its best fundraising year ever in fiscal year 2020-2021. From June 30th, 2020 through July 1st, 2021, including all gifts and commitments, the total was 22.181 million, and you'll see that in the bar to the very right. Planned gifts depicted in yellow and historically a strength for tech again led the way with 11.25 million, or 51% of the total. However, and this is important, outright gifts and pledge payments, cash in the door, if you will, was the highest on record in the last 10 years. That total, depicted in black on the chart, or maybe it's, it's brown, was 5.6 million, or 25% of the overall total. Does now, pledge mean that money came in that was planned previously? Is that what pledge? I'm not sure what the difference in pledge and planned is. Trustee Wilmore, a, a pledge means that there's money expected. A pledge payment is made in at least partial fulfillment of the pledge. And that differs from planned in? Yes. Plan giving is a, an instrument in which a donor makes plans, if you will, to give a gift to tech at some point in the future, uh, often after their lifetime. Although we should be encouraged by these numbers, the, the 22 plus million, look with me and imagine a line drawn just after fiscal year 2015, right in the middle, a line there vertically between that bar and fiscal year 2016. And you can see a discernible trend upward from fiscal year 16 through fiscal year 2021. Essentially, the right half of the chart is much more robust than the left half. Now, our task now is to sustain and build on this progress, a topic to which I'll return shortly. Madam Chair, as we move to the next slide, please allow me to offer some perspective on an ambitious goal shared by everyone who cares about Tennessee Tech University. President Oldham has challenged the campus to reach an enrollment of 12,000 students by 2025. We can do this, but it is a shared goal. Earlier in this very meeting, President Oldham said, everybody's problem becomes no one's responsibility. Indeed, attaining our enrollment goal requires the active participation of everyone on the campus. University advancement can and must play a vital role. The slide before you now relates directly to these high enrollment aspirations. Look with me for a moment at the purple bars. They depict the amount of scholarship dollars available through privately funded scholarships. The total was 17.3 million for academic year 2021 and 17.9 million for the current academic year. Again, these totals are not the corpus or the basic investment of a fund. This represents actually money that is available to be awarded to students, typically in the form of scholarships. Moving now to the yellow bars, they show the funding that has actually been awarded. So in the purple, we have money available. In the yellow, we have money that has actually been awarded. It's roughly 9.9 .9 million in fiscal year 2021 and 10.7 million in this fiscal year, an uptick. Relative to amounts, more funded has been awarded year over year. Even so, the amounts in, purple, in the purple bars have continued to grow most years due to handsome investment returns and additional funding, fundraising that is. At Tennessee Tech, we like our purple, right? On nearly every occasion and in almost every way, more is better. 
In this case, however, specific to this chart in the purple, I hope to come to you in the future, Madam Chair, with much more diminutive purple bars than is the case today. And the reason would be because we've done a better job in awarding our private scholarships. Chair Rose, on this last slide, there's a terrific picture of President Oldham, Chair Trudy Harper, and Trustee Tom Jones. This was taken at the reception honoring Ashraf Islam for his lead gift to the new engineering building. It was a great day for Tennessee Tech and for alumni around the world. While I will not speak to every point to the left on this slide, I do wish to come on the, comment on the bullets in their entirety in the following way. University advancement has a really important decision to make in the near term. We have engaged a diverse group of individuals from all over the campus to review submissions made in response to a request for proposal or an RFP. In the RFP, we have asked firms to tell us with specifics how they would undertake a campaign feasibility study and an advancement resources review. Stated another way, we first desire to raise a large amount of money for every area of the campus, and second, and equally important, we want to know what, what adjustments and additional investments, if any, must be made in university advancement to get that done. Madam Chair, I close with an example of how we view the choice of partner as it relates to impact and outcomes. There's a New York Times best-selling author whose name is Kristen Hanna. She's written Four Winds, Homefront, On Mystic Lake, among others. But what's really interesting, if you think about her audiobooks, is not so much her or even the content, but it's another name that we may not know, Julia Whalen. Miss Whalen is the narrator, and she says, reflecting on her role, and this is a paraphrase, I'm not an out front kind of person, and never, never could imagine myself getting on a stage. However, in narration, I'm able to play multiple parts. Julia's energetic, poignant, and very memorable narration makes Kristen Hanna's books come alive off the page. Now, just as narrator Julia Whalen plays multiple roles really well, mature, fully realized advancement organizations practice and demonstrate excellence in every area. As the president has said, it's not enough to be good enough here or good enough there. We have to be excellent and insistent upon excellence across every single area. So whether it's the first bullet up there, engagement in the right strategy across multiple theater, theaters, which I mean thinking about theater one as current students and involving them in our work, another theater is involving recent graduates 10 years out, or if it's to invite, as President Oldham has done so superbly, literally dozens of new viable top tier prospects rated at $500,000 and up. We can't just do those two things well. If I'm to report to you regularly as I did at the outset that we have had a record setting fundraising year, we have to do everything superbly. And so my closing message to you is that we will not rest until that is the case. We are absolutely feverishly determined to make sure we practice and, and do excellent work all across the board. And I'm grateful to, the, for this, to this committee for your uh, support of that, uh, to President Oldham and to the full board. And I'll gladly yield the floor. Thank you, Dr. Braswell. Does anybody have any questions, any comments for Dr. Braswell? Yeah, I just have a question. Maybe I misunderstood, but the, the, what's the difference or maybe the obstacles between or uh, preventing us from uh, uh, fulfilling all the funds that are available for scholarships? That's a good question, Trustee Lowry. Uh, the question is, what are the obstacles to being able to award all the scholarships? And the obstacles, as I see them, are different people on the campus own a slice of the private scholarships. For example, some of the scholarships are awarded by the departments, others by the colleges, others by the scholarships office, which is in Dr. Johnson's area. So our challenge as a campus is to bring more continuity and to coordination to those disparate areas of the campus and to have someone who is methodically looking at all of those things and to make sure those awards are happening. 
Another noteworthy piece, as you can imagine, if you have hundreds of scholarships, the criteria for those awards will vary considerably. Uh, if you're looking for uh, someone with, with, um, from a particular county, and that's the only uh, county from which you can award the scholarship, that's going to be difficult. So Drs. Johnson and Stinson and I are looking at, for those scholarships that are really difficult to award, what can we do to loosen the criteria so that we can make those awards? That actually reminded me of a question I meant to ask earlier. How does a presidential scholarship relate to a private scholarship? So if, I'm, if I have an ACT of 33 and a grade point average of 3.9, and, and I'm qualified for some engineering college scholarship, is my presidential scholarship additive to that? I think President Oldham may have stepped in to, to take this one. Um, and it may be a little complicated, Brandon. I don't know if you want to step back up or not. I mean, I think many of these scholarships are stackable uh, up to the cost of attendance. But uh, in, in general, we, we have two major pots of scholarship dollars. One is the university scholarship funding, which the presidential scholars would come from. So we budget, uh, these are university budgeted dollars for scholarships. Uh, and then there are privately funded scholarships through the foundation uh, that sometimes flow through the academic departments uh, for specific, uh, uh, you know, donor restrictions on those that uh, that we're referring to here. But uh, Brandon, you want to comment on <clears throat> on how they uh, how they stack or don't stack in some cases? Yeah, that, that was well well explained. Um, so. Uh, what we would call the admission scholarship, these are upon admission and, and as you come in, the presidential scholars, uh, that's a separate pool of funds. Um, and then the, what, what we call departmental or the, the funds from the endowments uh, or the restricted funds are separate and they are stackable uh, up to the cost of attendance. Um, and they work in various ways. And so um, students, because many of them have restrictions based on certain attributes, uh, whether it be a, a field of study, county uh, that they live in, um, various, various detailed um, uh, variables that go into that, the students fill out a scholarship app for the departmental side of it. So that's how we determine eligibility for. Um, and I would say, uh, you know, there are college-based uh, committees that make those determinations. And then there is, um, as Dr. Dr. Braswell mentioned, the scholarship office who uh, manages a certain amount of those and, and they all sort of come together as a full scholarship offer. Um, we try to make those, the presidential scholars go first. We get those out in, in the fall. Uh, departmental scholarships and the endowed ones, um, typically by February 15th, they have all the information that the various committees need to make those matches and, and are able to award those. We encourage them by March 1st so we can get that information to students so they can ultimately make a decision on attending tech. That's great, thank you. So stackable was my question. Thank you for answering that. So a quick question, Kevin, over here, Teresa. <clears throat> um, so the chart that you showed first, is that just the foundation scholarships? Is that what this chart is? That's correct, okay, Vice so Chair that's Van not the, mm -hmm. Okay. I, yeah, I, I'm a, kind of like Fred, uh, I should say Fred, I should I say Trustee Lowry. Uh, the difference to me is, is pretty astounding. And, and is that normal that there's, so, that that's, uh, and you know, is there, or, as far as the percentage of scholarships versus what's available? That's a great question as well. I think it's fair to say that over time, the amount in the purple uh, has grown more aggressively than we would view as satisfactory. So the aim remains to get those monies down. One practical reason is donors have given the dollars so that they can be invested in our students. So we have a responsibility, and to do so in an accelerated fashion, to get those dollars out as expeditiously as we possibly can. So what I'm saying is I'm not satisfied with what I see in front of you, and you should have every expectation in subsequent reports that I've showed demonstrable progress in those areas.
I have a question, uh, Kevin. If you um, if you're given these scholarships, are you giving away 100 percent, or trying to give away 100 percent of the earnings off of the principal, or are you trying to put some back each year to grow the principal so the scholarships will keep up with inflation? Trustee Stites, great question. I was looking just last week at a scholarship that was established in 1986 for $10,000, and the corpus had grown considerably over time. And so our strategy over a long-term period of time is for that 10,000 in 1986 today to have as much purchasing power and relevance as it did the day it established. So we do indeed take some of the earnings and put that back into the corpus or the base of the funds so as to protect the integrity of the endowment overall. Is there a policy that governs how much you put back? We do have an investment strategy. I'd probably have to defer to Dr. Stinson or a member of her team as to the precise way that we make those investments. Uh, I know that it's done because I see it in the reports that I get and it's done well. I don't know, Dr. Stinson, if, if that's beyond the scope of what we can get into now or not. Yeah, Trustee Stite, so the, obviously for foundation uh, assets, the foundation board uh, governs the uh, expenditures and investment strategy uh, and they look at this uh, on a regular basis and we've been operating uh, on a 5% spend rate uh, most recently so basically um, and, and that's that's typically it's been under uh, what the investment return has been so to your point uh, you know and it varies from quarter to quarter, actually, a little bit, but but uh, it's, it's been several percentage points. Uh, spend has been several percentage points below the uh, investment return. So, I, Clary, I don't know if you want to add to that. So, uh, we do have uh, two different investment pools. And one of those is for the endowments, which I think, uh, uh, Trustee Stites, you are talking about. And, and so that has a longer term uh, investment policy, more investments into equity type uh, investments. And then we have an expendable, uh, which is uh, funds that we think there's a possibility that we will be spending uh, within a few years. And uh, so it has a combination of some equity investments, but it has more liquidity in it. And so that's a part of how we handle it. And then our endowments have, uh, we're aiming for a 8% average investment return over long term with a spend rate of 5%. So that would be putting 3% back into those investments. I was going to comment um, on scholarships and some on committees that award scholarships that a lot of these later in academic career scholarships, which is how some of them are funded, are difficult to give at times because it is dependent on a very specific criteria of somebody reaching um, a certain part at that barrier level, usually a junior or senior. For instance, we have one of the Captain Anderson scholarships that we have in the music department requires a certain amount of participation in one of our ensembles which almost didn't exist last year because of uh, COVID. So even though I have a certain dollar amount, I would feel it in, irresponsible to um, award that at a level, the same level that I would have an, an, another year. And we have that frequently, or we have scholarships very specifically that are underfunded um, with an, um, an award amount. So we wait uh, uh, sometimes, unless our department can meet that, that means. So there are scholarships that kind of sit out there that are a little bit hard to, to meet. Um, though we do the best we can to generously reward them. So. That's a great point, Trustee Alcott. The other thing I'd say, Vice Chair Van Hooser, is that some of the purple is justified in that if we make an award in year one, we have to be fiduciarily ready to continue that in subsequent years. Another relevant point, too, is gift agreements that stipulate how scholarships awarded have to reflect our values. One of the core values, of course, is retention and graduation. So uh, sort of a corollary to Trustee Alcott's point is if you have an award that's not renewable, 
so that a first year student can't get it for the second year, that's a disincentive for student persistence. And so we look for those things to try to make sure that's not institutionalized, if you will, in our documents and in our awards. It sounds like a lot of complexity, but, and I'm not always good with it, a lot of complexity, but, but uh, it also looks like a lot of opportunity. And I would just encourage you, and it sounds like you, and your team, it sounds like you're doing this, but encourage you to, to be creative and think about how we can le leverage this opportunity to, to help meet the, the, the goals of the university and the needs of the students. So uh, just to, 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 to not get so caught up in the details, to think about how do you maximize the flexibility to, for the benefit of the university and, and especially the students. Yeah, Trustee Larry, you're exactly right. The opportunity here is substantial. And uh, that's what we're gonna try to do is try to uh, unleash this because I mean it, we are in a very competitive market for students and uh, it, it's kind of like, kind of like ending the game with uh, with not using your timeouts you know he, he, we, we, we don't need to end this game with uh, with timeouts to spare so we need to put these funds in, in use many of these funds have very complex letters of agreements and sometimes you don't have a family member anymore to approach with that. So the university, of course, we're trying to do these with the wishes um, of the people who gave us the money. And that's a real challenge. And I'm not sure how you approach that after a certain amount of time, because there is a decay of the structure in which it was given. So that might be something to comment on as, as well for my benefit and maybe others. Yes, as far as uh, the difficulty of making awards, we try to go back to family members or the heirs of family members to make adjustments in the criteria. But Dr. Stinson and I are systematically grouping together uh, those scholarships for which heirs don't exist because they're no longer alive. And we can, given our mission as a foundation, go to a judge and plan to as sort of an omnibus package to get those criteria adjusted in the interest of making awards because it will be certainly clear to any reasonable judge that the money was given not to accumulate but to benefit students. We've done that once before. I think it preceded my arrival in spring 2015, but that's part of our strategy also. Thank you. Very good report, Dr. Braswell. Anybody else before we go on? I'll just say uh, congratulations as well. You said the uh, best fundraising year ever, and I think that is fantastic and something for you and all your team to be commended for. Next, we go to our report on research and economic development. We have Dr. Jennifer Taylor with us today. Dr. Taylor, glad to have you with us to give us an update. Thank you, Chair Rose, and uh, good morning to the rest of the board. This is my first opportunity to come before you to present, so thank you for having me today. I'd also like to share some good news with you. Um, I want to touch on kind of four key topics from the Office of Research and Economic Development. And um, to begin with, I want to, um, I'm sure you're pr probably aware that President Oldham has challenged us and established a goal of increasing external research to 40 million. And I'm happy to announce today that we are well on our way to reaching that goal and with a record high this year of 22.77 and change. As you'll see, this is a 14% increase over uh, last fiscal year, fiscal year 2020. And I really want to um, acknowledge and, and appreciate our faculty and staff who contributed to this. This was. Um, uh, just a Herculean task in a year of a pandemic with so many other changes. And it just really reflects the, their dedication and determination um, to provide wonderful opportunities for our tech students. Um, what I really think this has also contributed to is we're submitting more and more proposals, um, which are ultimately becoming funded. And um, I think this is in no small part to a lot of our strategic plans and our strategic hiring over the last several years. Okay, another good piece of news I'd like to share with you all and bring to your attention is our Research and Creativity Creative Inquiry Day. This is an annual event that is designed to promote student research and creative in inquiry. Um, this is uh, open to all undergraduates and graduate students and it is open to all departments so that they can showcase their scholarship. 
This year we had almost 225 students and 68 faculty judges and community members participate. Um, this was all across, uh, an endeavor from all across campus. The scholarship produced during this time um, and displayed during this time was truly something to be proud of. And I think um, everyone has done a wonderful job in, with this endeavor. Speaking of being proud of our accomplishments, I'm happy to announce that our Tennessee Center for Rural Innovation won an award of excellence by the University Economic Development Association for our Rural Reimagined Challenge. Now, what they've won is in a category called Talent in Place. And what this category does is exemplifies how putting the right people in the right environment will benefit the community and the, and the economy. So for those of you that may not recall offhand what our Rural Reimagined um, Grand Challenge was, it was established in 2019 as part of our Tech Tomorrow strategic plan. The goal here is to create a challenge that all students, faculty, staff, and community members have the opportunity to engage with and to transform, to transform rural living. Just to give you a few metrics about how we've been doing on this. In just over two years, all nine colleges have been involved. We've had over 200 rural projects. We've had over 100 faculty and staff participate. We've had over 1,500 students who have logged over 50,000 volunteer service or internship hours. And we have almost 3.5 million in research grants awarded to, under this initiative. We're also primarily serving the Upper Cumberland at this point, as all 14 counties are engaged. But I'm also proud to say that it's, it's scalable and that we are, now have a presence in 44 of the 95 Tennessee counties, and we keep growing. Oops, sorry about that. And finally, I want to draw your attention to another um, wonderful activity that's going on in our office, and this is Eagle Works. Now, Eagle Works is a yearly Shark Tank style student competition for innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, what this involves is over 250 students and all nine colleges over the past nine years have taken, have taken part in this. We've awarded over $100,000 directly to students to aid their businesses. We have two patents awarded to students to date. We have four total winners who went on to attempt startup companies, and these four are still in business and have collectively created over 10 full-time jobs and 25 part-time jobs in our state. It's also um, a, an amazing accomplishment to me that our 2017 winner recently took on a million dollar investment. So they're continuing to, do, to grow and be strong. These are just a few of the great things that are happening here at Tech. And with that, I will ask if you have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Any, any questions for Dr. Taylor? Any comments, questions? The Eagle Works program seems impressive, but I would just ask what, I would hope that that would grow more. Uh, do you have any projections or expectations of that in the next few years? Excellent question, Trustee Jones. Um, actually, we do. Um, we are very proud of how our students have uh, fared at larger competitions within the state uh, to go on. And we have recently are working and almost um, ready to announce that we have uh, more donors for that, um, to, to continue to grow that. And we're also continuing um, to encourage our student teams and to participate in uh, more of these type of competitions, both uh, within the state and nationally. Any other questions or comments? Do you feel that the creative and research events that are usually held on campus, many of which were canceled last year or became virtual, do you feel like that number is back up to snuff? Are there still virtual opportunities, still things being canceled? I know Creative Writing Day, which is usually a big thing on campus, was, was canceled this year. I was wondering what the trend is. As far as our students, Trustee Alcott, um, yes, we uh, still um, plan on holding things. I don't think, know if we've made the decision whether it'll be virtually uh, this year or in person. Um, we're, we've got a little ways to go. This is an annual event usually held in the spring. 
Um, so we'll make that determination at that time. Any others? Well, you did a great job with, <laughs> at your first time. Glad to have you here with us uh, as well, and, and best Thank of you. luck to you. And uh, I would congratulate you, just like uh, Dr. Braswell, for uh, having the, the highest funding ever and external funding. That, that's great for your researchers. <laughs> Well, thank you, and, and that's really a, a, a credit to our faculty member. They're, they're the ones doing the wonderful work. <laughs> Very good. Great news. With that, Chairman Harper, I think our committee has completed our business unless anybody else has something that needs to come before us. Thank you, Chairman Rose. I will ask, I think we need to take a... As one of my friends used to say, a hydraulic pressure break, and so we will, uh, that's for all of you engineers in the room, and uh, uh, we will start back with the Finance Committee, and I show that it's 1047. We really need to get started by 5 till, till 11. We're, we're a little behind, so um, if we can, uh, everybody be back in their seats in no later than 5 till 11. Thank you.
minute. I think he's coming this way. I think that's him. All right, I'm going to ask everybody to take their seats. And then I'll... Um, and Rick, I didn't ask you before I started the last committee meeting. Do you need me to wait a minute before we... We're good to go anytime. I'm sorry, everyone. We're, we're working through the streaming on this. And so forgive me if you're watching this and it looks pretty clunky. Um, Mr. Stites, I think we're ready to get started. Okay. All right. Uh, a call to order and a roll call. Uh, Mr. Secretary, please call the roll. Yes, Trustee Harper will be serving as a member of this committee today as allowed by bylaws in the absence of Trustee Lynn. So, Trustee Harper? Here. Trustee Lowry? Here. Trustee Stites? Here. You have a quorum, Madam, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Well, the minutes have been placed in diligent for your review. Is there any discussion about the minutes, or can I get a motion to approve the uh, June 24? 2021 minutes. So move. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Harper. Aye. Trustee Lowry. Aye. Trustee Stites. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, the financial update. Dr. Stinson will give us an update on the university finances. Dr. Stinson. Thank you, Chair Stites. So the first thing I wanted to do was to give the committee an update on uh, our end of year uh, for fiscal year 2021 status. So we ended our year with a uh, approximately a $20 million fund balance uh, that's made up of our 2% uh, uh, fund balance that we're required to uh, carry from year to year. Also, unspent uh, budget carry forwards of uh, a bit over $7 million. And then special fee carry forwards uh, make up the, the majority of the rest of it. Uh, so I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about a couple of those special fee carry forwards, the technology access fee, a million and seven. And so we've spent some time this past year working on uh, how do we uh, maximize the benefit to our students of, pay, of that, uh, the resources from that particular fee. We've also used some of our care fund, CARES funds money uh, mm -hmm. to address uh, some of the things that They're are more specific board, to the pandemic, and therefore we didn't have to use our, our TAF okay. resources. I also wanted to talk about our engineering special allocation. This is the fourth year of that special allocation. And I just wanted to let the committee know that the uh, College of Engineering has designated uh, a, a little over one and a half million dollars of that towards salaries and fringe benefits for faculty positions. They have also been using those funds to purchase equipment and, uh, and quite a bit of uh, renovation to spaces. Uh, uh, within uh, in their facilities, but they also are uh, have designated some of those funds so that they will have those available to address equipment needs and that type of thing when the uh, new building is open and ready for them to occupy. And uh, so, so that uh, balance is uh, is even though it seems like it's. Um, a little high. It does have designations on it. I also wanted to talk just a bit because these numbers do not include uh, the federal CARES and her funds. Uh, so I wanted to talk just a bit about what we have done uh, recently with our uh, her funds, and, and I think Dr. Johnson talked about it a little bit earlier, somewhat. But we did disperse a little over twelve million dollars to our students in the fall semester. All of our students were eligible. 
Uh, so we ended up dispersing to uh, 9,896 students, and those awards ranged from a high of $1,830 for uh, students who were full-time, had tremendous need, and uh, demonstrated by we used uh, expected family contribution in our uh, Pell Award data for that. And then the smallest amount was uh, 171, which was for a part-time student taking uh, perhaps one, one course. Uh, so that was kind of where we are on that. So we have been looking at the tuition and fee uh, based on our fall uh, enrollments. And so we do have uh, some positives, some negatives. We are working through that, and it will be brought back to the committee in December as a part of the October revised budget. Uh, some of our numbers are positive simply because we had the 2% tuition increase, and those funds had already been designated for the collapse of uh, SACF fees that we talked about and, and the board approved in June. So, uh, I, and I'll point out, uh, a couple of other things on the slide. The impact of the fat, flat rate uh, tuition model has been about five and a half million dollars. And the impact of reducing our out-of-state domestic tuition has had a positive impact on both our undergraduate non-athlete, graduate non-athlete, and also our undergraduate and graduate athletes. Graduate athletes? Can you define what that means? Excuse me? Graduate athletes, 138? Yeah. We've got 138 athletes that are in graduate programs. I mean, what is that? I'm not sure what that's telling me. You're off. Do you mind to repeat? I, I couldn't hear you. Yeah, I'm not sure why. Yeah, I said I, I don't understand what that's telling me. The graduate athletes plus 138, what is that saying? That's what we, the, the graduate athletes that normally they would have had to provide a, a scholarship for out of state or else they would have had, uh, uh, had to pay that tuition rate. So, so we have been able to uh, well, have Let me, let me clarify. Maybe it's clear to everybody but me. But is that saying there's 138 graduate athletes? Is that what that's saying? The ones that would be out-of-state domestic students is what it's saying. I need to check that number, Barry, because it seems a little yeah, I didn't know we had, if, if that's what it's saying, I, didn't, I had no idea we had 138 graduate-level athletes. That's why it's confusing me. I'll check that number because it does seem a little bit high. Why don't, why I may don't you have... let us know after, you know, you can just email us all, Clary, but it's a good question. I think your do... question is, not Captain Wilmore, that why would we have any students? I mean, I know you have a few students who are graduate students who are athletes, but that seems like a high number. So why don't you just let us yeah, know? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Give, given the extended uh, eligibility due to COVID, there actually are quite a few uh, athletes that I know a few that have graduated, but they still get another year to play. So that might be inflating. Yeah, that's number. a good point. It just seemed 138 just seems like more than what I would have expected. So, and 138, if I understand it correctly, is just the out-of-state ones that are here uh, using our new tuition model. So you probably have some others as well. Yeah, I, I think Trustee Lowry uh, identified it. I think it's the extension of eligibility has has caused a, a lot of students that have graduated to continue their eligibility and uh, going for graduate work. So it's, it's, pr it's fairly common now, actually. That might be something we all consider later when we see a lower matriculation rate of graduate students, that people are entering graduate school with the purpose of finishing out their eligibility but not necessarily attaining degree. I'm, I'm afraid we might forget that bump uh, later. I'm not sure how that will work. Yeah, I think, well, this is anecdotal, but I, I think you'll find that uh, student athletes that do pursue graduate school to continue their uh, eligibility actually do graduate with a graduate degree as well. So it's, it, that's actually a very positive thing. I remain optimistic. Yeah. <laughs>
Chair Stites, are you ready for us to move on to the capital uh, projects? If there are no questions by any other trustee, I'll be glad to move on. Go for it. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, before I get into the items that I have for capital uh, projects uh, to be approved by the committee, uh, Dr. Oldham, I think you had some things you wanted to share with the, with the committee. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Stinson. So, I, I want to take the opportunity just to show, run the, the board through a few quick slides here just to give you a big overview of, of capital projects because I, I realize that at times this can be a little confusing, uh, partly uh, the process uh, that we are required to go through for, uh, by the state of Tennessee, but also just how we designate certain types of projects. So, just uh, sort of a capital projects 101 slide here. Uh, keep in mind that state-funded projects uh, fall into two categories. We typically refer to them as capital outlay, and those are new construction and major renovation, significant uh, major renovation to existing facilities. The other is capital maintenance, uh, and these typically come from the state of Tennessee in two, two buckets, two very distinct buckets of funding. Uh, and, it can, and the amount in each bucket can vary substantially from year to year as well. So capital maintenance uh, obviously is, is maintenance projects, can be renovation. Uh, so uh, sometimes if it's major enough, it falls in capital outlay. If it's not as significant, it's in a capital maintenance line. Uh, the the uh, allocation of the, both these pots of money uh, are sort of dependent on the the fiscal state uh, of things uh, any given fiscal year, uh, as well as uh, priorities within the state of Tennessee on where they want to focus. There has been a, a little bit of a uh, shift uh, over the uh, past year or two to, to do more in the way of capital maintenance, realizing that uh, most campuses have a lot of deferred maintenance and uh, Governor Lee and his administration has wanted to chip away at that, and so we've seen some, some movement in that regard, and we continue to see some movement. Then the third category is university-funded projects. These are, these are projects that are funded locally uh, through any combination of, of private funds, uh, university funds, uh, and, and potentially uh, financed through uh, state school bond authority as well to help uh, finance those projects. These can be new, new construction, so a new building, can be major renovation, can be a maintenance project, uh, any of the above. Keep in mind that all of this is, is guided by our campus master plan, and the campus master plan, the most recent version of that was, was developed in 2014. Uh, just to remind the board that there is a current project going on to uh, revise our campus master plan uh, and you will be hearing more about that. We have a information session scheduled for November uh, to meet with the board and uh, uh, Bauer asks you, the, the lead architects on the campus master plan will be meeting with you to go over that. At this point we're uh, also in the process of, of establishing uh, focus groups on campus, meeting with uh, faculty, staff, students, to gain input into the, master, the, the new master plan that will guide us over the next uh, five to 10 years in terms of continued campus development. So uh, hope, we plan by the December board meeting to be in a place where the board can hopefully approve the, the new master plan at that point in time. But, but all these projects uh, have to be coherent, consistent with the campus master plan. And so, you know, most of these have been uh, at least uh, considered or thought about years in advance as we continue to, to move through these. So just to remind you as well, in June, at the June board meeting, you approved going forward to the state for a request. Now, these are capital outlay requests. So these are either new construction or major renovation. Uh, and this was a, is a normal process, and the process is that uh, the, the project uh, leaves campus, it's a proposal to the state, the state will score that, 
and it competes with other projects around the state in higher education and then uh, depending on the level of funding available and how well it scores, uh, you, you may or may not uh, be successful at the end of the legislative session with receiving uh, uh, funding to go forward with that project. So as you, as you know, we've been pretty successful with that in recent years, the new science building and now the new engineering building have, have both gone through that process. So in, in June, you approved going forward with the uh, capital outlay proposal for renovation of Johnson Hall with the College of Business and the demolition of Foster Hall. Uh, that's the, the old chemistry building, which has now been replaced with the new science building. So that's, uh, that's in process. We, haven't, we have not yet heard uh, from the state how well that project has been scored. But subsequent to this, and this is where it's a little unusual, and that's why I wanted to kind of walk you through this a little bit. Uh, this, is, this has been an unusual couple of years in a lot of ways, one of which is that the uh, state uh, finds itself in a, in a remarkable position of having uh, some additional cash to be able to invest. And so they, they decided to, to initiate a second uh, competition for camp, uh, capital outlay requests, totally separate. And uh, the, the criteria on this particular competition had to address state workforce needs. So the, the project being proposed to score well, it needed to uh, have some impact on our ability to meet uh, the workforce demands that the state either has currently or anticipates having in the next few years. And secondly to that is uh, they wanted to see projects that had a significant amount of community engagement attached to that. And so, uh, you know, when, when you have these kind of one-off opportunities, uh, you, you, you sort of have to step back and say, okay, what, do, what, do we, what is on our campus master plan that could compete effectively for uh, this kind of opportunity. And so it may seem a little odd to some, I guess, that we're proposing a second new engineering building. Uh, this one uh, is on the lines of advanced construction and manufacturing engineering. Just keep in mind that that is on our campus master plan, has been on our campus master plan uh, for some time. And it just so happens that it, it really meets the criteria for this competition. There are other projects that we, we may well have decided above this one in terms of campus priorities right now, but they would not have competed well uh, in this regard. And so uh, for this meeting, we're, uh, we'll be asking you to review and approve going forward with, uh, with this proposal to the state for advanced construction and manufacturing engineering building. Uh, obviously, this is, uh, both of these are pending uh, THEC recommendations and uh, the upcoming legislative session, uh, and we'll see how they both fare. But uh, I just want to make sure that that's clear in everybody's mind what we're doing and why we're doing it, why we're suggesting this. And let me just pause there for a second and see if, see if you have any questions about that. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Okay. Um, so, capital. Just, do you have, yeah. uh, if I missed it, forgive me, but more plans or more description of this building? Y yes. Well, we do, and uh, and I'm not the best one to be talking through that. Actually, you know, as as you can imagine, opportunities sometimes pop up like this, and uh, it helps to be somewhat prepared so we we weren't completely flat-footed but we had to we had to put things in high gear really fast to get the concept together on what we would do because we we really wouldn't have been pushing this building quite yet um, but uh, it is an opportunity to sort of replace uh, what's it currently in Lewis Hall and uh, the foundry as well as take all of that effort to a whole new level. And uh, the, the provost and uh, dean of engineering and uh, faculty have, uh, have jumped in really quick to kind of put a, 
put concept uh, to paper and what that would actually be. And I, you know, there'll probably be an opportunity for them to explain that to you. But, but uh, it's uh, it, it, it's really geared uh, sort of a multidisciplinary approach to uh, some of the uh, practical applied uh, aspects of engineering. I hope I said that close, to right? Um, so in terms of capital maintenance requests, again, uh, you all approved going forward with this back in the summer. Uh, the maintenance projects uh, totaled to about $9 million. Uh, and that, again, that's pending state appropriation uh, through the legislative session. But the kinds of things we're, we're dealing with there, the craft center, uh, foundation hall upgrades, uh, uh, the road and university center, uh, HVAC system, and uh, elevator upgrades around campus. So that, you know, we, we really need to keep pace on, uh, on chipping away at the deferred maintenance on campus, and, and this would go a long way to help him do that. So that's, uh, you know, nothing I've talked about so far takes away from the, the maintenance issues. So, so the other thing I really want to make you aware of is, is disclosed projects. And disclosed projects, again, those are the ones that are self-funded, uh, can be any combination of, of existing university funds, private gift funds, or Tennessee State School Bond Authority bond financing that we can make available. And Dr. Stenson could walk you through uh, how that works and uh, what our debt capacity is and, and, and all of that. Some of you that are a lot more interested in those aspects. You know, since this is a, this is a sort of a different project and, and we really haven't done much in this uh, as a board, I want to make sure that you're comfortable with these projects going forward. So what we're going to do today is introduce you to two that we'd like to come forward with. Uh, what, we, what we're suggesting is that we will uh, provide to the board uh, later this month pro formas on both of these projects so you'll have a chance to look at the business model, the business plan associated with that uh, to make sure that you're comfortable with all that and then then come back uh, in December at the December board meeting, uh, hopefully with a request for approval to move forward with these two projects. And so the two projects, one is is West Tucker Stadium. So our our uh, our project idea is to move forward with uh, tearing down the west side of Tucker Stadium and rebuilding that. Uh, here you see a architectural concept of what that might look like. Uh, we did engage a, uh, an architecture firm that's, that's very good in stadium construction to give us some, some conceptual ideas and to try to get it into a cost uh, uh, level that we thought we could manage. This, it's estimated that this could be a $30 million project. Obviously, there has to be revenue streams attached uh, to support that, uh, that debt payment, and that's what the pro forma would lay out for you. So uh, the other project is a parking garage. Uh, this one would go on Wings Up Way uh, next to the current uh, uh, Ray Morse Hall STEM Center, uh, and uh, it'd be about a, uh, it'd be a three level, 420 uh, space parking garage, uh, estimated cost at $14 million. And again, we'd have a uh, pro forma for you to look at in this project as well. So um, again, a lot of moving parts here with capital projects. Um, again, uh, the, 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 for today, uh, to look at the, uh, uh, the new engineering building, uh, for approval to go forward to the state with that request, requ uh, the, uh, the deadline to submit is middle, middle of October, so we're on a, a short time frame to get that uh, proposal in. Uh, these disclosed projects, timing-wise, there, there are two times a year that we can request uh, financing through the Tennessee State School Bond Authority, and uh, one is in August and one is in January. So we really, if we can, if we can make uh, hopefully get everybody satisfied with these projects and by the December meeting get approval, we'll be able to meet that January deadline for uh, bond financing with these projects. So.
Questions? Curious of the timing when, when, if this goes forward as you propose or you hope, what timing, what timing will these things, like will the West Stadium be torn down and, and those projects start getting underway? For, for the stadium project, the timing? Yeah, the timing for these future disclosed projects. So you're saying January. When will we start actually doing construction? Those yeah, so, uh, you know, it's a good question. So it, it really depends on how quickly we can move through the design phase and get it into uh, actual construction. I, you know, I'm ambitious, but I would like to see the new stadium finished and ready within three years. Uh, that's, again, that's pretty ambitious, but that's, that's my goal. And does this West Stadium also include coaches, office, locker rooms, those type of things, or just? No, it does to, to, get, to get the project in the money, what we've done is we've split this into two different projects. So there's a separate, that I haven't mentioned, there's a separate project going on now, attempt to raise private dollars to, to build a separate uh, uh, operations center for football and practice facility. Uh, that is ongoing. It is, uh, we have uh, volunteer leadership in that campaign, and it's, uh, it's gaining some momentum. And I, I fully expect that that will be successful as well. I, I, can't, uh, I can't put a time frame on that as well. I think we can get the stadium done within three years, uh, and, uh, and hopefully we can get the practice facility done at about the same time. But yeah, we'll well, I, would, I would say that I'm very encouraged. I'm sure some others are as well. We've been talking this for a long time, the need for this, so actually get some energy behind it to actually take steps going forward is very exciting. So mm -hmm. thanks for everybody. I know a lot of people have done a lot of work to get us where even, yeah. even we are now. So we've still got a ways to go, but thanks for all the effort. Yeah. And we have, uh, in the interim, we have, uh, in fact, they're installed now, uh, pretty much fully installed. The, the, we have put in some modular offices for the coaches uh, to keep them dry. <laughs> and so uh, that's... Uh, that will be available for the interim period as well. So just to clarify, we're only doing the west side of the stadium, and the west side would have 5,900 seats. The east side has how many seats, and what will be the total capacity of the stadium? So the total capacity of the stadium most likely will, will diminish some. Uh, I, I think officially our, our capacity is close to 16,000. Our, our average attendance is, is half of that or less. And so actually what we would be doing is we'd be reducing the capacity, seating capacity of the stadium, but in, uh, improving the, uh, the quality of the seating substantially so that the, uh, the new side would have uh, various levels of premium seating, chair backs, club level, uh, some suites. Uh, that's, that's what we have uh, designed it so far anyway. So do you envision then some years later then redoing the east side as well, following up with that? Yeah, you could. Uh, I, think it, I think it leaves a lot of options open uh, for the future to see uh, how the program continues to evolve and develop. but. Uh, it would certainly make us competitive with our peer institutions uh, athletically uh, and put us in a good spot in that regard. Yeah. So the, uh, the, the modular uh, offices for the coaches and everything, that's not on the west side, that's somewhere else, so it won't be impacted by this construction? It shouldn't be impacted by the construction. That's, that's, uh, we didn't have the luxury of having a well-developed plan for the stadium when we needed to do something with the coaches' offices. So if we need to make some adjustments going forward, we will. But I, I, I think we can work around that. And then one other follow-up question. The you know, Tennessee Tech has been doing the, the TSSAA championships for years and there are other community events. I know sometimes the high school has games there. Um, I guess what is the coordination or impact with the county, the state? Uh, to continue hosting and supporting those events. Because, I, you know, this stadium mm -hmm. in all my life has been an important impact to the community. So I think that, you know, whatever yeah. updates to, I don't know if you can get funding or whatever, but it's, uh, it's you know, it's an asset to not only the university, but the community. And yeah, you're exactly right. And uh, we, we fully expect that to continue and even be enhanced uh, through this. I mean, it's... Uh, 
you know, we've, we've had conversations and we continue to have conversations with multiple partners on how they can be part of this project and how everybody can benefit from it. So we, we look forward to making that happen as well. And, and I guess my only comment would be, and I, I, this is not a reason not to do it for sure. I mean, I, I think it's a great program. You got to move ahead with it. But in the interim, uh, if we lost a TWSAA to some other school, uh, that would be tough. I don't know. I don't know if you can keep keep it throughout this reconstruction. Well, we we actually already the community already lost the football championship. Uh, that was uh, it was rebid this year and uh, it was awarded to Chattanooga uh, for a two year period of time. Uh, I think we uh, actually it was a very it was a pretty close competition. Uh, the quality of the facilities was one aspect that uh, turned it uh, uh, away from us, and so that's another compelling reason why we we should do something here uh, significant. But but the truth is we're getting to a point where we, we don't have a lot of choice. I mean, we've got to do something. And uh, I think this is well, one reason I, uh, I want to get this in front of the board as soon as possible is because we need designers looking at this and making sure that we've got a financial plan that matches the, the stadium build out concept so that the financials all work and, and we get what we need. Yeah, just wanted to say I, I appreciate so much that the university and the community has supported things like that and Boy State and other programs that have huge statewide visibility and not, you know, not to change the subject, but I think those are tremendous recruitment tools and I think that this new stadium will be of tremendous benefit to help and enrollment as well. Probably pay for itself over a period of time. Yeah, I agree completely. Yes. Trustee I know Harper. you're going to give it, or you or Claire, somebody's going to give us a pro forma very quickly on what your revenue expectations are and all that. But on the funding expectations, I assume the pro forma will also address those. And some of that will be bond funding, as I know, and some of it will be, if, reading your notes, some of it will be university funded and some of it will be private funded. I'm just wondering how, have we started the private funding for this project? I know you're working on the mm -hmm. independent total yeah. private money project. And do these two compete? How, does that, how are those going to fit together? So um, I think they're, they're very complementary and, and to a large extent the same type of, of uh, partnerships and, and donor support. Uh, are interested in both projects. And so there's a lot of overlap, but they, they can be very separate as well. The, um, uh, I think most of the, I think when you see the pro forma, you'll, you'll be able to see that the, the funding availability to do the stadium uh, is largely, not completely, but largely separated from private donors, individual private donors. And so uh, the, the football operations center and practice facility will be largely, in fact, probably almost exclusively funded by private donors. So from that standpoint, there will be a pretty, pretty clear delineation. But I think to your, maybe to your bigger question is how, how do these uh, self-funded disclosed projects fit into the big universe of other things that we've got going on and is there, you know, if you do this, does that mean you can't do something else? And, and uh, you know, I, I don't want to overstate this because, I mean, clearly you can only spend a dollar once, legally at least. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I think these two projects uh, should not have any significant impact on anything else that we're doing. And, and perhaps you're answering this question, but my, my question was actually not nearly that smart. Um, my question was really more related to Barry's question, and that was how will private funding impact the timing of these projects? It, mm -hmm. Do you already have enough private funding for these, or will you have to still yeah. raise money? So uh, on the stadium project side, it, uh, I mean, it, clearly it would help, and it would help expedite some things, but... I don't think we're going to be nearly as dependent on private funding on the stadium project as we are the practice facility. The practice facility, uh, timing-wise, is going to be almost completely dependent on level of private funding availability. 
Uh, and what about the parking garage? Does that require some private funding as well? I'm sorry. Parking garage? Does it require some? Par parking parking garage? No, that that would be uh, university income streams, and I, I'll let Dr. Stinson address that more completely. But really, no material private money needed for that. No, uh, you know, and of course, it's. It, I mean, if there's somebody here in the room that wants to get their name on a parking garage, we'll be glad to to work with you. But typically, donors are not not lining up at the door to well, that's maybe to the best thing here to get your name on it <laughs> maybe the most popular the thing i hear the students ask about the most yeah so anyway I, I hope i hope this helps sort of um lay the framework for all this so you kind of understand what's going on but uh, if there's other questions as they come up we'll be glad to answer so if there are not any other questions can i have a motion that we uh send the fiscal year 21 and 22 approval uh, for disclose, disclose projects to the uh, Lewis Hall Transformer to the board for approval and place on the board's regular agenda. I, I will make that motion, Mr. Chairman, but I don't think we've actually heard about the Lewis Hall Transformer just yet. Oh. Sorry. I don't want to get... So you can go ahead, Clary, and tell them about that. <laughs> Got one more disclose project. Sorry, Johnny. I'm trying to get to lunch. I know you are. Okay, I'm going to slip through these real quickly, uh, Trustee Stites. So we do have a, a disclosed project uh, that uh, we need to move forward, and this is in the current fiscal year of 21-22, and it is a Lewis Hall Transformer replacement, $150,000. It is university funded, and this project is being coordinated with the College of Engineering to upsize transformers in secondary feeds uh, to allow the engineering, uh, allow our College of Engineering to install some robots in to Lewis Hall. So that one does need a uh, approval by this committee if you also choose. Anybody want to make a motion on my committee? All right. uh, yeah, I move we send the uh, disclosed project for the Lewis Hall Transformer to the board for approval uh, and placed on the board's regular agenda. Thank you, Fred. Uh, is there a second? And I'll second. Thank you. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Harper. Aye. Trustee Lowry. Aye. Trustee Stites. Motion passes. Okay, uh, the next item is approval of the capital budget for capital outlay revision. So this is the uh, second project for our capital outlay request for state funding. This year is the one that uh, Dr. Oldham talked about a, a few minutes ago. So it is in addition to the renovation that you all approved in uh, June. This is anticipated to be a $62.4 million project. It does require a match of uh, $4 million and of that match we have to have Six, uh, one million six hundred thousand coming from uh, from private gifts. Uh, so, uh, thank you. Um, is there, does anyone have any questions about this? I just have one, I think, and that is, what's the timing of our requirement to get the gifts in the door? Can we we can submit this, and then, as I recall before, we didn't have to have our money lined up for some time. Is that still correct? That is correct. And uh, also, uh, there is a mechanism through T TSSBA to uh, fund pledges as we are uh, trying to work through that financing. So we have also, assuming this one was one of the projects selected for funding, we could start moving on design immediately as, uh, as early as July. Of 2022. But, but to, to Trustee Harper's question, I mean, realistic, you probably got at least three years, right, to to raise the gifts or pledges. That is correct. That is correct. Mm -hmm. And and what is the? Maybe you said this, and I missed. I didn't understand it. What's the additional match to make eight percent? Oh, that's the university part of the. Got it. I ne now I understand. Never mind. I just. 
It's just a part of that uh, process. Uh, we do have a certain one third of any match has to be coming from private funds. So that's, that's what the difference is there. Okay, are there any other questions? If not, I'll be happy to take a motion to send the 2022-23 capital budget outlay for the construction of a second engineering building to the board for approval and place it on the board's regular agenda. Is there a motion? So, so move. Thank you, sir. Second. And a second. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Harper. Aye. Trustee Lowry. Aye. Trustee Stites. Aye. Motion passes. Great. The next item is update capital budget maintenance. Dr. Stenson. So when we brought our capital maintenance uh, projects in June, we knew uh, and discussed with the committee that there might be some modifications. So that's what uh, this slide is showing uh, in column uh, three. That was the pr project uh, projected cost for our from our June meeting. We had two changes uh, since then, so this is just an update on those. Priority number four, uh, once we got to looking into all of the issues with the HVAC, uh, we think a $900,000 cost on that project is more realistic, which meant that priority number six, stormwater system repairs, would drop off of our request because we are limited to this nine million three twenty-eight for uh, the upcoming uh, fiscal year 23. Uh, so uh, it's just a, simply an update to let you all know what's going on. We will bring then the stormwater system repairs forward in the following year. Any questions? So why do we go to zero on the stormwater? Is that because we decided not to do it? We, we can't fit it within the request, and so it was our priority number six. The other five had a higher need than that one, so when we had to get within our dollars, we just dropped that one off, and we will bring it forward uh, in the future. Okay, thank you. Uh, do, is there no discussion? So we can now have an opportunity to uh, capital main. I think we're, uh, we don't have to any, do anything on this. So we're moving on. Next time, anticipated disclosed projects, Dr. Sensen. So this is the two projects that the president uh, discussed a few minutes ago, the football stadium project, the wings up parking. Uh, as uh, Dr. Oldham said, uh, we are working through those, uh, uh, looking at bond funding on the football stadium, about $23 million. I will be bringing to you all uh, in the next couple of weeks pro forma statements on that, and also the parking garage. Uh, so uh, that one will have a, uh, about $12,900,000 uh, of bond funding. Uh, it, the other million dollars will come from reserves that we have in our transportation fund. Anyone have any questions? Just curious, if the parking garage, I, I didn't see a picture of it, is it going to have kind of the aesthetics of other buildings? Is that the plan, or is it going to look like a parking garage? We haven't started yet on our, uh, any design on that, but no, we hope it does not look like a parking garage. Oh, it, it won't look like a parking garage. <laughs> Let me just say it that way. Now, we have a board policy that they, you cannot build any buildings that are not Georgian architecture. That would be considered a building. Gotcha. So they, they won't do it as long as I'm chairman of this committee. So it, is, it is noted that we will have, not have a parking garage that looks like a parking garage. So, so Thank that's you. A, since we haven't started designing, we can make that happen. So I don't think we have any action required on this item. So now we'll go to the performance evaluation and performance-based 
compensation analysis. Dr. Stenson. Uh, so, uh, Chair Stites, uh, I would like to uh, ask uh, to introduce our new uh, Associate Vice President for Human Resources, Mr. Kevin Vetter, and ask him just to speak to the board uh, for a couple of uh, uh, seconds. I'll give you some of his background. He has over 30 years of experience in, as an HR professional in higher education. Uh, and that includes uh, approximately 30 years at Purdue University and four years at Salisbury University. He has also been in military service for 25 years. So, uh, uh, Kevin. Thank you, Dr. Stinson. It's a pleasure to be here with the Board of Trustees. I want to thank you for this uh, opportunity. and. President uh, Oldham, and uh, certainly it's been uh, a great uh, opportunity here at uh, Tennessee Tech, and I've only been here about uh, 30 days now, so I guess I'm the new, new kid on the block, but uh, certainly happy to uh, be here. As, as Dr. Stinson alluded to, I've been in higher education, human resources, uh, about uh, 30 plus years, 30, almost 33 years now, starting out at uh, Purdue University and then going over to Salisbury on the eastern shore of Maryland for about five years and I uh, saw the light and had an opportunity to come here. Uh, so uh, really happy uh, to be here. Uh, also, I've got uh, 25 years of military leadership experience, uh, primarily spent in the Army National Guard, but uh, spent a lot of time overseas after uh, post 9-11 and going to some uh, places uh, far and abroad. So uh, a lot of uh, different experiences there. but. Uh, I'm certainly happy to be here. Um, as I was reflecting on this uh, way back in uh, the, I guess the summertime now, applying for this position, I had an opportunity to actually watch a board meeting that was televised back in June. And one of the things that struck me from an HR standpoint is a culture of an organization. And I was very quickly able to, to you know, really find the, the positive culture here at Tennessee Tech. And one of the things that really struck me was that particular meeting you were voting on, I think, the, or having to make the difficult uh, decision of selecting the student representative by uh, Trustee Hannah Willis. And the, you know, I could just see the, the level of sensitivity, compassion, and difficulty in making that, you know, that decision and, and noting that you know, there were two other candidates that weren't going to be able to be successful but acknowledging their, their presence there and their contributions. And that really told me a lot about the, the organization, Tennessee Tech as an institution, and really uh, in many ways drew me uh, to come here. So I'm, I'm happy to be here and looking forward to pr you know, promoting HR and supporting the university uh, in human resources and, and what we can do to help you know, drive the university forward uh, in terms of the strategic plan and all the objectives that we have laid out. And certainly one of the things uh, when we talk about performance and performance-based pay or merit pay, I certainly would commend the university and I think you're in the right direction in that regard. I think that, you know, uh, organizations, uh, you know, best practice organizations certainly do have a, an element of performance-based pay, merit pay, so I think that's very important. I certainly think it needs to be built on a foundation of you know, using objective criteria to evaluate our workforce and how we're going to be rewarding and re recognizing those individuals based on, you know, evaluation criteria, which really fits into the training component of that and really emphasizing and reinforcing to our supervisors that are having to really um, manage that at the, at the employee level in helping them with the tools and the training to be able to effectively do merit-based pay. And then just, um, you know, certainly making sure that we're rewarding our top performers in terms of the compensation that we have available. So I think all of those things taken in totality are, are critically important to a successful merit-based uh, pay program. But uh, that's just really kind of, like I said, I'm 30 days into it. I know we're going to evolve and push this uh, forward in the future, and I'm looking forward to being a part of that. Uh, if you have any questions of, of me, I'd be happy to take those at this time. Anyone have any questions? I'm going to ask you one. Uh, you're new to Tennessee, is that right? That is correct, sir, yes. Has anybody explained to you that in Tennessee it is a law that we have to 
give merit raises based on performance? Uh, that has been emphasized to me, yes, sir. Good. So that we, we want to be sure that we comply with state law. We will do so. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Thank you very much. All right, thank you. I appreciate it. I don't think there's any action on this. So we'll move on to the Edmonds Estate Quasi-Endowment. Sorry? Oh. Okay, go ahead, Clary. Okay, so I'm going to slip through these pretty quickly because it's information you all have seen in the past. Uh, but just a reminder that this is the sixth year of our performance evaluation process. And uh, so we have uh, uh, continued to make progress on, on those evaluations. And as uh, uh, Mr. Vetter said a few minutes ago, we, you know, we still have some opportunities and, uh, and, and we'll continue to work on that. Uh, so these these were the criterias for uh, uh, faculty for non-faculty staff evaluations, uh, and uh, they're uh, a, they're very much like what we have done in the past. We do uh, have a process that involves the employee in reviewing their job duties and also in uh, uh, their self evaluations. So I'm going to slip over to uh, looking at what actually happened in uh, uh, 2021. So this is for the staff, non-faculty. Uh, it is a percentage of employees rated in performance uh, categories for 2020. We got 53.5% of our uh, staff, non-faculty staff, rated as middle performers, and we had 46% of our uh, staff uh, rated as high performers. When we look at our uh, faculty performance evaluation process, it is also, as it has been in the past, it does include evaluations for both tenured and non-tenured, and it is, the evaluation is performed by the department chairs and the college deans. So when we look at the faculty as a percentage of employees rated in performance categories, you will see that we have 87% of our faculty rated as high performers in 2021. And also uh, we had 10.8% of faculty rated as middle performers and 1.9% as low performers. So moving on into our performance-based compensation. Uh, we did have the 4% poll, uh, and, and it was distributed based on the eligibility that the board had approved at an earlier board meeting. We did use uh, uh, a combination of performance evaluation scores for both uh, calendar year 2020 and calendar year 2020, uh, actually uh, fiscal year 2020 and fiscal year 2021. Uh, we did have the minimum award set at 1% and maximum award set at 7%, and that was for employees with acceptable or better rating for the faculty and meets expectations or better rating for the staff. When we looked at the number of individuals, and uh, this is staff, uh, not, not the faculty category, uh, we did have 296 uh, staff who received increases in the high, performing, uh, high performers category and 391 in the middle performers category. The average increase was 4.78% and 3.47% for the, uh, the 4.78 was for high performers and 3.47 was for the uh, middle performers. Looking at it from a breakdown of uh, classification of employees, we did have 268 CNS employees that received increases. We had 390 uh, administrative uh, individuals who received increases, and we had 29 executive. The uh, CNS received on an average of uh, a 4.27% increase 
uh, the administrative was a 4.16, and uh, the executive classification was a 3.96. When we look at the faculty distribution on base salary increases, we actually had 328 faculty who received increases in the high performers category and 67 in the middle performers. The average increase for high performers in the faculty was 4.2, and the average increase for uh, middle performers was 3.15. So we. Uh, the information that I presented is, is uh, graphs are similar to what we have presented in the past. Dr. Oldham did ask us to make a deeper dive into this data and uh, look at, you know, what are the specifics? You know, where are, do we have some problem areas? Why are these closer than we would expect them to be? And so he's going to discuss that. Thank you, Dr. Stinson. Uh, Chair Harper, you asked me, uh, I think, at the June board meeting to own this, and so that's exactly what I'm doing. And I think I've asked you that three or four more times, too, haven't I? Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, I think, uh, uh, and let me just cut to the chase on this. Uh, I think we did, a, we did a lot of things pretty well this time through. There are some areas where we still uh, need some improvement, and I think that's what's going to be highlighted in the next couple of slides. So if you look, uh, if you, you sort of have to peel this back and look at different groups of, of uh, faculty and staff on campus and even different units uh, because there are, obviously this, this is a distributed kind of process. We have, we have evaluations being done uh, two to three months before salary recommendations are being conducted and so that uh, in time and sort of space too, the, these are these are two separate operations, and so how to get them connected appropriately sometimes is a little challenging. And 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 then there there are differences among units on campus in terms of priorities and uh, and other things that they need to try to address. And so there's there's often anomalies that you kind of have to work through. So just to give you an idea, though, beforehand, uh, after the, the last board meeting when we proceeded uh, with this plan, I actually did meet with uh, deans and department chairs uh, on the academic side and stressed the importance of distributing raised dollars commensurate with their performance evaluations. Now keep in mind those performance evaluations in many cases had been done two or three months earlier, but nevertheless that's what we had to go on. And so I stress that it, we would not approve going forward anything that didn't, didn't correlate with, uh, in, at least generally with uh, how those performance evaluations uh, turned out. So. I'm going to walk you through a couple of slides here. This is a staff summary. So this is staff across the whole university. And you see two lines there. You see a, a line that is uh, the so-called high performers and the uh, mid performers. And you get a little bit of an idea. There, obviously, there is a distribution between 1% and 7%. And uh, that, that distribution varies a little bit depending on if you would consider them a high performer or a mid performer. And that's a little bit arbitrary distinction I'll talk about. So if you look at staff. The, Just the, to understand that previous sure. graph, sorry. It, go back one. So does, is that saying that there were some high performers that got a 1% and there are middle performers that got a 7%? Yes, that is what that's saying. And so that's, that's obviously, there's some anomalies that, now this is, uh, I think I'm right here. What, what, basically there's three points in these, each one of these lines. And so there's, uh, there's the highest in that category and the lowest raise in that category and then sort of the midpoint or the, uh, uh, the, the, the average. And so, yeah, there, are, uh, there were anomalies in, in, in several categories where you, you'd have a, a, uh, a mid-performer getting a 7% raise for some reason uh, and uh, some cases where a high performer was getting a, a lower raise for some reason. Now, 
you, you, obvious questions is why would that happen? Uh, you know, there are cases where, for example, a staff member may have just received recently a, a, a large uh, salary adjustment or a, a promotion of some sort. And so, uh, you know, a, a unit supervisor might not feel it appropriate to tack on to that if they just received that a month or two earlier. So you, you get some sometimes quirky things. Yeah, I just want to make a comment. I was going to make this comment later, but, but it seems like a reasonable time mm -hmm. is that I, I'm, I'm actually glad to see this because uh, no amount of formula or metrics or whatever, you know, we, 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 we try to do this in a, in a rational formula-based fashion, and I think that is the right thing to do. I don't have a problem with anything I've seen here, but I just want to make the comment that the formulas, evaluations, metrics is not a replacement for leadership. Mm -hmm. And a, a good leader has to look at all of those things and realize that there are often subjective things that, that are not taken care of in this kind of analysis. You know, for example, when you had the chart up a moment ago of all the different things that you might evaluate an individual, every individual, whether it's staff or faculty or whatever, they are individual human beings. And they should not be, um, you know, forced to fall into some sort of structured category of what we think they ought to be. And uh, I, I expect and sort of demand good leaders, whether it's at the department level, the dean level, chairperson, whatever, to be able to recognize, cultivate, and support those talents that may not necessarily fit into whatever our structure or metrics are. And so... I, I, in some ways, I'm glad to see this, and it doesn't, I think it's right. I, I, would, I would hate to see some sort of just formula, numerical-based system that, you know, spit out your raise, and no other human was taking the leadership responsibility to make those decisions. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Trustee Jones, and uh, and I, I actually completely agree because there's there's no perfect formula, and it's hard to factor in all these variables. Uh, you know, the strength uh, the strength of our approach is that it is depending on those unit leaders, the ones that are doing the annual evaluations of faculty and staff, to also be the ones making the the recommendation on their compensation. And so the, the primary responsibility falls they are there. Now, you, you, obviously, it could be subject to error if you've, got a, if you've got a rogue supervisor that's doing something inappropriate. And that's why it's really important for at least uh, another set of eyes to look over that and say, is, is, this, is this justified? Does this make sense? And that's, that's what we're attempting to do to make sure of that. And, and that later leadership is a multi-layered approach. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, you know, mistakes will get made and they have to be corrected. And there's no perfect system, but a system that constantly strives to improve itself and reward and pay people based on merit is, is the right approach. So thank yeah. you. Appreciate it. Uh, you remember last year that uh, Faculty Senate President-elect Luna gave a really nice presentation on equity challenges in a very strict system and that there are still equity challenges and I would mm -hmm. hope that yeah. some of these anomalies are addressing that but that's something to keep in mind um, that there are problems that are you know that are just cultural overlay from yeah. uh, and that salary, equ equ salary equity needs to be considered in making up some of that ground so um, I'm thankful for that presentation I know that we're supposed to keep that in our memories. Yeah, and I completely agree with that. And that's why I guess when those discussions were made that uh, if there is inequities that need to be, you know, at whatever level, then the leadership must take the responsibility to do that. And if we had too closed a system or too regulated a system, you wouldn't have the authority or, or the opportunity. So, and it, this is something I'm looking forward to working with uh, Mr. Vetter, who you just met. Uh, I think he, he brings a lot of... Uh, experience and skill to this because being able to sort of dis
actually distributed. So as, as sort of you could pick up from what Dr. Stinson showed, uh, our staff evaluation and, and their, you know, to the high side. Now, you know, there may be some good reasons why that's the case, uh, uh, that it's not a, a typical Gaussian distribution around the, the cent center of value, but, uh, you know, and I could, I could certainly argue that that's the kind of employee we want at Tennessee Tech, you know, the better than average. So, you know, that may be. 143,359 dollars and 71 cents. Uh, Clarence Edmonds graduated from our College of Business in 1957 with a degree in accounting. According to his children, Mr. Edmonds always credited the, the education he received at Tennessee Tech for his success. And although the estate gift did not place any restrictions on the gift, Mr. Edmonds' children has requested the university to establish a quasi-endowment in their parents' name to award scholarships to accounting students from the endowment income. So my request to this committee today is for approval to transfer the funds to our foundation for in per investment purposes only and to ask the foundation's board of directors, directors to establish a quasi-endowment from the gift funds. The gift will remain a university asset, but we'll uh, use the foundation's investment mechanism to invest the funds. Does anyone have any questions? Certainly have no problem with this. I was just curious, why does this come to the Board of Trustees and not just directly to the Foundation Board? <clears throat> the estate, uh, this particular estate, and this, may, this is the second time we've had this happen. <coughs> Excuse me. They did not have discussions with the uh, university or the foundation or any, any persons here. And so they designated their gift to the university. We cannot transfer a university gift to the foundation. So that's why it's like this. And, and Clary asked me if, if, I don't even remember if it was you, somebody asked me if we should just issue kind of a blanket approval of these kinds of things. And I said, you know, I don't think it's a bad idea for this board to hear when someone has given money to the university. And so I just, not, not that I don't have, there's no, I don't have any nefarious thoughts about anything else. I just think it's nice to hear about when someone has given the money to the university that we take the affirmative to, uh, to transfer it, so. Any other comment? If not, uh, can I have a motion that we send the Edmonds Estate to the board for approval to establish quasi-endowment and to invest the funds through the foundation common fund and to place on the board's regular agenda. Is there a motion? Oh, I'm <laughs> so, so moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Yes, I'll second. Okay. Secretary, call the roll. Harper. Aye. Trustee Lowry. Aye. Trustee Seitz. Aye. Motion. motion. Excuse me, motion passes. The final item is uh, tenure upon appointment recommendation. Dr. Bruce will present this recommendation for tenure upon appointment. Uh, Chair Stites, before I leave, I just want to say I checked on the uh, number for the uh, athletes under or graduate. It is a correct number, and it is based on students athletes who had finished their undergraduate degree and and due to COVID they were, did have eligibility and so they moved into the graduate program and, and so that that number was correct. Thank you for that timely report.
I'm pleased to present recommendations and supporting documentation for granting tenure to an eligible faculty member, Dr. Kumar Yelamarthy. This tenure recommendation is being presented at the October board meeting because Dr. Yelamarthy was hired between the June board meeting and this board meeting. And as you know, we, we typically present all of our tenure recommendations at the June board meeting. Um, Dr. Yelamarthy was hired as professor in Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and was hired to serve as associate dean for the College of Engineering. I'm presenting his recommendation for tenure on behalf of President Oldham, and the recommendation is fully supported by the faculty and the chair of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, the dean of the College of Engineering, and myself. Does anyone have any discussion? If not, can I have a motion to send the tenure recommendation to the board for approval and place it on the board's regular agenda? Uh, so move. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Secretary, call the roll, please. Trustee Harper. Aye. Aye. Trustee Stites. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. So the uh, adjournment of the open, this will be the adjournment of the open session of the Audit Business Committee. The non-public executive session will begin, at, you won't admit, do it after lunch or after a short break? Break. Let me, um, let me just make, we're gonna do it after a short break is the answer, right? Oh, the streaming's back. Okay. I just need to make everybody aware that we had a technical difficulty about 15 minutes ago or so, and we lost our streaming of our committee meeting. Um, it was uh, unrelated to anything other than just a technical glitch. And so um, just if someone were watching and, and learned that we had lost our stream and you hear that for some reason, you can let folks know it was a technical glitch. Um, we will not be streaming, of course, going forward, and we are not required to stream our committees. We're doing that because we think it's a good idea, but we, it was not a problem for us to continue, and, and the secretary asked me, and I said, let's finish up. Uh, I would like to continue with our, with our non-public session next without taking a break, if that's okay, and then we will break for lunch. Is that appropriate, Mr. Secretary? Yes, it is. Okay, terrific. Thank you all for joining us this morning, and we'll look forward to seeing you back. Um, are we still going to try for 1.30, Diane, or no? We're going for a later time. We're going for a later time.